A very good morning to all our uh, speakers and uh, uh, attendees of the second day of this symposium on open space. We call it Open Space Matters for evident reasons. And uh, so yesterday uh, we had two panels, uh, panels and uh, what's interesting is over the two days uh, the way uh, topics have been scaling up, you know. So we started with a session on architecture and design and uh, uh, then we went on to talk about planning and urban design in the second session. And uh, again, design, planning and policy to a great extent, despite, I mean, though the talks yesterday to some extent indicated that there are other ways to look, about, look at those, they're highly anthropocentric activities still and uh, that came through in the presentations and also efforts to maybe kind of divert our attention to the land and landscapes and what their voices are then the less uh, vocal voices of the land uh, and we are hoping that today's talks will directly speak to that aspect of our landscapes and uh, when, when our speakers talk about ecology and spatial mapping and uh, talking about nomenclature that tends to uh, kind of uh, again change our perspective of what land is, right? So with a very brief introduction, I invite my colleague Jagruti to introduce the speakers and we'll get started. So uh, we just, uh, uh, Jagruti will introduce all speakers at one time and then uh, we can start with the presentations and we'll have the moderat moderator come in in the end and then have the discussion. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much ma'am. Uh, with this I would like to introduce our first panelist, Dr. H.S. Sudhira, Director Gubi in Gubi Labs. Dr. H.S. Sudhira obtained his PhD from Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. His thesis on studies on urban sprawl and spatial planning support system for Bangalore, India. His research is primarily on land use and land cover change studies exploring the consequences of environmental sustainability and understanding their interrelationship with natural resources using transdisciplinary approach with a focus on taking theories to practices and vice versa. He has been a part of various sustainable initiatives, notably Namma Cycle, the campus-based public bike sharing system. He is also a neo-geographer using and propagating free, free and open source mapping tool and mapping maps of cities and ecosystem. I welcome you, sir. Yeah, thank, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Salila and everyone uh, here at Army College of Architecture. I'm really glad to be here. And uh, it so happens that uh, although I thought of this title of what I want to talk on exploring landscape, especially and legally, uh, incidentally or rather coincidentally today is also observed as National Law Day now and since 2015 this is observed as Constitution Day. Uh, I guess uh, that sets the premise for what I would want to talk about uh, for the rest of the presentation. Uh, so I, 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 at some point I think I'm all over the place. Uh, this is called Pilar Lava, which is a National Geological Monument. And in a first glance, you will pass this off as some uh, uh, technically a wasteland, as government of India may want to call. But uh, this is some two and a half billion years old rock mass uh, or structures that are there. This is about 200 kilometers from here uh, before Chitrasurga. So maybe if some of you are interested, you should just go and explore that. Uh, I yeah, just like to premise that uh, one of the things that may many of us I think uh, are really concerned about uh, this whole categorization of wastelands at a micro level and uh, this is the recent uh, wasteland map of India and uh, there are some 16, 17 categories or more than that now that are all classified as uh, under different categories of wasteland. Uh, the wasteland atlas of India is available if you just Google you will find the entire report and all of this there. Yeah. So I think the key concern here is that uh, all like water log marshy land, land with open scrub, dense scrub or something that 
Uh, some of us feel are ecologically very important and often overlooked and unfortunately even uh, deserts and coastal sand and all of that. So this the whole premise here again comes from an extremely anthropocentric sense that uh, land has to be productive for agriculture or something like that or any economically productive activity and I think that's, that's a key concern that from an ecological perspective for us there is no waste land and uh, some of us are trying to see how you can redefine that and all of that. Having said that, I think I'll come back to Bangalore uh, to look at uh, how the land cover changes happened over the years and you, as you can see, the kind of uh, built up growth in red has really kind of moved ahead and our, our sort of, this sprawl is pretty evident in that sense. Now, uh, the concern is now, what do you call uh, a city as in, uh, I want to get into some bit of definitions here and, and, and also understand some other aspects there. So legally this is BBMT, so what you see in black is, is only the city corporation limits. So areas around Electronic City or beyond uh, Nelmangla or around that Nelmangla side or even on beyond Kemgeri towards Bidhi and others on the Mysore Road or all of it technically uh, is outside Bangalore limits. So uh, what is a city is, is something that I want you to really probe in. I don't know if you had really looked at the actual definition of what you call a city, as in like, let's say what, what defines Bangalore. I'd have liked to take a much detailed look, but I, I, I'll, I'll, uh, I have a separate discourse on, on what that is, but I'll, I'm just cutting it short here. But to give you a context, there is, there is this master plan imagination, which is beyond the BBMP jurisdiction which is I'm sure many of you would know it is a Bangalore metropolitan area jurisdiction which is a local planning area that extends beyond the city corporation limits. Now having said this I guess this is another imagination of what Bangalore is perhaps in was in 2015 and the same is in Vogue but we'll talk about a little bit later. But legally right uh, while we may all have different notions of what a city is uh, there are standard definitions on what a city is as per the Karnataka Municipal Municipalities Act, uh, Municipal Corporations Act, and there is also something defined as what is an urban area by Karnataka Urban Development Authority Act. So strictly, this defines what a city is. And there are different classes of cities. That's when, uh, based on which, Government of Karnataka will decide whether a city will have a city, uh, city corporation or a city municipal council, town municipal council, town panchayat or what it is. So based on that, this is this. So the municipal corporation act is very sacrosanct. There are also other definitions of what an urban area is based on census of India. So and then unfortunately, like census of India definitions uh, are dated. I think that is something that we may have to look at because there are three criteria that define what an urban in as per the census which says first one of the condition is that any settlement about 5000 persons per square kilometer 5000 persons the second is about 300 persons per square kilometer the third one is more than 75 percent of male working population it's kind of pretty gender biased in, and uh, working 75 percent of male working population working in non-agricultural purposes right and it also says what purposes that males working in non-agricultural purposes, then only it can be classified, or like one of the criteria for classifying it as an urban. I fail to imagine how that is feasible, like for a place where I live in Gubbi, which is about 25,000 population, I can't think of even a thousand male persons working in non-agricultural activities. Because that's that's an area where you have agro-economy, like at its peak in a sense. We are not a services sector like in Bangalore, where you have many people working in non-agricultural activities. And like I know more than 75% are working in agro-related activities there. So that's that's the case there. I think that's somewhere we'll have to relook at what definitions are there. As in, uh, what I'm saying is that uh, a lot, most of the time uh, we work with certain assumptions and our own biases. And it's important to question those fundamental questions that we operate with, or fundamental assumptions and biases we operate with. And when I started looking at it, I, I feel very unsettled when you look at the definition of, of what a city and urban itself is. Moving forward, what we are looking at is cities as complex systems and no longer looking at them as something in equilibrium and uh, also applying notions of ecology, right? We also see cities as evolving. 
in the sense, uh, the very very notion that cities have formed is because of a sort of a human social organization. We're looking at it as how it is evolving in that sense, and looking at how they emerge and uh, they are not top down but bottom up and self organizing in that sense. And planning as a discipline, I think, has only happened in the last couple of hundred years, and particularly post-industrialization. And what we see is that uh, there are standard notions of controlling, limiting sprawl through either your zoning regulations or FSI and things like that. And what has been in practice? So what has happened is, uh, I think. Uh, uh, we have been uh, uh, sort of really uh, uh, like to kind of go, go after with this uh, geometrically well uh, laid out idealized geometric plans that I think uh, is is a misnomer to how we want to look at cities and particularly the way spatial planning is done. And to give you a set, put things in context, when we look at cities or, or anything under the urban in Karnataka, you have so many things that are operating in their own ways. And more importantly, this is something that I would, I would perhaps spend a little more time, is some of the acts that are in place, uh, that are influencing everything that we look at, uh, perhaps the urban landscape at, at large. Strictly, uh, right, as in uh, everything that we say as land or something uh, comes under the, falls under the purview of Land Revenue Act. Now, when you see there is a deputy commissioner or a di di district magistrate for any district, technically she or he is operating under the revenue department of the state of a respective state government, and they are in, in charge of sort of la you know, revenue lands. Largely, even the tahsildar or all of them are operating under the revenue department purview in that sense. So, land revenue act is a very key act that we need to know, take note of. Then we also had municipalities act. But the key thing that I really want uh, you to take note of is the Karnataka Town and Country Planning Act of 1961. This was made uh, following the British Town Planning Acts. And uh, again, uh, taking a step back, uh, as you may know, uh, urban is like mostly like a, is a state subject. So respective states are asked to make their own laws. And Government of India at the central level can only give directions legally. But since uh, respective states can form, so we have all the state level acts that are formed, uh, that, that are passed. Something that I want you to really make note of here is that most of these acts were passed like 50, 60, 70 years ago. Notably, Karnataka Town and Country Planning Act, which, which followed the British town principles, right? Town planning uh, principles there. And we haven't really uh, uh, looked at it in a very serious way in the sense what we have uh, always done in the last 60-70 uh, years on of this act is that we've only amended them very regressively. I, I'll talk about one particular regressive amendment that has happened to it. Uh, I think uh, this was one of the most uh, regressive amendments that happened to the Karnataka Northern Country Planning Act by the insertion of Section 76 FF in the uh, Belgaum uh, session in 2007 January. So essentially, it looked at regularization, uh, regularizing uh, unauthorized construction and development. The only good part in that whole Section 76 FF is it's any any open spaces need not be really uh, regularized, but uh, public spaces and uh, con development and construction in public spaces and open spaces need not be regularized. But that's a very unfortunately very subjective one. As it stands, this is under a legal uh, turmoil. But uh, I think uh, what has happened uh, since uh, uh, 61 is that there there have been several amendments to the way town uh, uh, to the town and country planning act, and I think uh, our legislatures have uh, have only made it more regressive in the days. And uh, what we need really is to reimagine that in the sense. Uh, I have a more detailed uh, uh, mind map, if I may say. I don't know if that is visible. Uh, but essentially, 
part of my uh, work. I, I, I like to look at uh, who has done what and when did they bring what amendments and across. So this essentially tries to map out uh, under whose jurisdiction, uh, whose regime, which political party did what, uh, what were the different things that are done, what did respective governors do, what happened to like uh, things like that. So that's what I, I know, one of the things that I keep looking at and there are issues on that. And of course, while we have the state acts and things, we also have different things coming from the center. Like, I'm sure many of you would know of smart cities and all of that. And the latest is creation of, you know, these uh, service agencies as companies. Uh, I would, if for those who are interested to know more about this, I would encourage you to read my article in the Canada last month, uh, where I, I argue that state's Big Brother Act is actually ruining the city. Because as we, as we stand, uh, the state has more than 100 companies that has that it has created and works in a monopolistic manner. In the sense, uh, all of your services, I think that this urban local body or any elected body is supposed to be doing it is divested with a company headed by a bureaucrat and they no longer seem to be accountable. The key transition is uh, the citizen as you, uh, who you are, as in you are transformed from a voter to a consumer. And I think that's that's something that you need to reflect upon. Uh, so there are different entities that are created and uh, we talk about this. So the key question is who is planning? And uh, again, uh, if I may ask the audience, do you know who is planning for energy in Bangalore? Take a while, guess. The answer is nobody. This is a very startling fact that I got to know from by like, talking to MD, um, you know, uh, MDs of Bescom. I spoke to senior leadership in KPCL, member KERC, secretary in government of India, Karnataka. Uh, across the spectrum, right? Each of them are looking in their own silos. Bescom is only interested in distribution. They make working plans. They are not planning for energy. KPCA does something else and they have certain allocations based on some, some of their own plans. So there, strictly there is no agency that is actually looking at what is the energy demand for Bangalore and planning for it. We are in a similar state with respect to a host of things because I, I think, uh, but there have been different agencies that have done different plans. So there are so many plans that are done across for the city. Uh, over time and and the tragedy is uh, only the master plan or the comprehensive development or plan or investment master plan of 2015 is the only one that is legally valid everything else doesn't have a statutory backing which means it can't be enforced by law so that, that comes to a perspective, that's why I talk about law, because I think you should also look at what are the implications from the law perspective, because if you are making any plan and it has no legal binding, it is a waste. And most recently, there is some effort called Bangalore Climate Action and Resilience Plan that is being made by the DMP along with C40 cities and WRF. The tragedies I've seen all of these plans and none of these uh, have remained to the date because they fall back because you don't have an enforceable plan. Comprehensive traffic and transportation plan that was made in late 2000s was something that was said when, which, on what could be the ring roads, what could be the metro uh, phases and all of that, but it was not never integrated with your land use master plan. Or they don't talk to each other and land use plan is separate plan and transportation plan is a separate plan. And we now have a climate and resilience action, a climate action and resilience plan. So all of them are, are, are done in silos in some ways. That's primarily because our law doesn't permit that. So if you talk, if you have, I would encourage you to go and talk to either the town planning member at BDA or uh, the assistant director, or joint director in town planning section uh, of the BDA, as as a sort of a general casual interview with them to understand what entails planning. You will, I'm sure you will get a different perspective because if you talk of all of this, then they will say, end of the day, they will come back to, see, to you and say, 
section 9 section 4 of ktcp act very prescribed like specifically prescribes this is what has to be done and so this is where we limit our master plan because it doesn't really account for a lot of things and as we speak even in 2022 this plan is unfortunately in vogue because the state government which had notified a draft master plan for 2031 cancelled it and wants to do a new master plan for 2041 so all the plan approvals that are given are based on this master plan that master plan for 2031 cancelled it and wants to do a new master plan for 2041 so all the plan approvals that are given are based on this master plan the population of the city is almost 1.3 crores today and we are still sitting on this plan and working on it uh, having said that i think uh, that's where i think we would re really like to you know reimagine the planning in that perspective and particularly from a landscape ecology perspective i have uh, particularly one instance uh, that i would want to bring in to you is that uh, how many of you have seen iic campus know of iic campus right you know there is an endangered species there take a guess sorry no Ah uh, yes, techno sort of. You could call it as a tree species, not tree tree, but something that depends on tree. Exactly, slender lorries. It's a primate. Uh, they live in groups, so we have an isolated population of slender lorries inside ISC campus, and. Uh, if you look at the landscape there, to the north, it is uh, it's blocked because of Matikere and all of that. And to the west, you have Eshwanpura. South, beyond Maleshwaram, 18 crores, it can't come down. And to the east, you can go up to Sankey Tank and parts of Sadashiv Nagara, and then it cuts off. So there is no way that population is now able to move across in the sense they are isolated. So when uh, such communities get isolated in ecology, I think well, we are more concerned that in, in a matter of few generations, chances of them surviving there becomes a challenge, right? So it means that they'll have to go out and breed with other communities or other groups. Now that's something that is difficult because now these uh, lorises who have now isolated are like are isolated because they move only on canopies. They don't come down, like they don't come literally come down to ground. They need connected canopies. That's the key there. So. This is again uh, natural supposed to be a natural landscape for lorises and we have failed to imagine or accommodate them in the land plan. What has prohibited us to imagine to have a collect connected tree corridor from let's say GKVK to Kebal, IAC campus, Kaman Park, Lalbagh, across Port Main in Jainagar and then all the way up to perhaps Turhali or uh, Banergata itself. Just that we lack that imagination of how you want to also have connected tree cover, for instance. So this need not be for only trees. We also have particular birds that are only canopy dwelling. Uh, you have certain uh, bird species that are old, that only move in shrubs. They don't go up to high up to the canopy. Some of the warblers don't go up to the canopy. Some of the other flowerpickers and others they don't come down. So we have different set of you know like sort of com bird communities that stick to certain assemblages. Now, if you, what we really require is a sort of a multi-stakeholder type, as in you know, different uh, perspective actually to look at how do you want to engage on this. Now, if I talk all of this and you want to come back to look at how do we do this planning legally, the law doesn't permit it. Right? I can only tell a narrative like this because this is what we can imagine. But when I want to actually make it happen, our town to dear town planning members or, or the law doesn't get it. So that's where I think we really know Having said that, I think what we really know need now is that uh, I think we need a new special law, planning law. It's high time we think of a new special planning act because uh, today we I think we uh, we have, may have a better understanding of how our cities are functioning. Although I wouldn't say we have a complete understanding of how cities are functioning. But we certainly have a better understanding of some of those things. We have better models, we have better computational methods, and no longer we need to look at having a master plan as a static document. That's something that I've also been uh, talking about, is that we need to have it as a more dynamic document, 
that is one and the other thing is we will also have to reimagine it from a bottom up perspective having fast battery planning in place so that's a, that's a hard nut to crack and that's something that we will have to really really look at it. Um, sorry to interrupt but because we are talking about a top down or a you know bottom up approach uh, looking at the legal frame would it be rather as an entry point to begin with for some broad committees to come together and propose uh, one such uh, you know, if you're looking at something, imagining the way the connected tree cover. Yeah, I think uh, so. There are different scales at which different things can be uh, attempted. Like again, uh, if I'm looking at at a landscape level, like right, for a tree cover, right? It will be very difficult for a particular ward committee to only uh, address it. You will need at a regional, as an at a different scale. So in ecology, there are different aspects. As in at a landscape level, right? So if, even if I can, like there are different scales at which we need to really look at. There are some aspects that works very well at a ward committee level or, or at a ward level. There are some things that we may have to really look at it at a slightly higher scale. Like when it even comes to uh, water, for instance, right, we have three key watersheds. So we need to reimagine from the watershed perspective from those three watersheds. And that I cannot just go to one ward, ward, ward committee and then ask them to do something about it because that that ward, ward that watershed people have, people in that watershed have to come together. I can't just isolate one ward, ward committee. That brings to another question that is another related thing is on the imagination or, or the how the boundaries are created. I didn't really talk about it because you know, it's a different uh, digression if I may say because. All the institutions that I mentioned that are operating on Bangalore all operate under different boundaries. What really remains for like how, how does a uh, ward gets decided in the BBMP? They are technically determined based on census emuneration blocks as per the census. It's now, population correct. Now there, there is also a lot of politics and things going on. I'm sure you're reading in the newspapers what's happening with the election, electoral rolls and all of that. The political economy is at play and there are different set, set of things there. Now, uh, in that context, right, now when we look at data, I mean, I've been keen to look at data on, let's say, on crime or on water consumption or power uh, consumption. None of these agencies, jurisdictions at the subdivisional level overlap with my population data. Because Bescom subdivision and BWPC subdivision or police uh, jurisdiction station limits don't overlap with any of these. And if you look at the service coverage of BMTC, it's beyond. You name it, I'll tell you none of them are actually overlapping. Even if you look at post offices, I've been always puzzled why post offices are also not come from into our world boundaries or something like that. So you have like pin codes are different with uh, different places. So they are also not confirming to one thing. So it's a very complex thing, and particularly when some of us are keen to look at data and what's happening over time and all of it, it's a maze. So, and all of these boundaries are there. That's why I go back to the definitions, and that's why I said I get very unsettled when I look at definitions. So then, when you really uh, look through those things, set of things. So, it requires a different set of things, but uh, to answer your question, right, as in, uh, we need to really look at uh, the bottom up. And not everybody, right? As in, all of us come with our own biases and worldviews. Now, for a sit for a lay person or any citizen, they may not have the complete imagination of everything. Now, the challenge, therefore, is for us to make sure they know at least some set of things and ask, help them ask the right questions. Now, as planners, I think uh, philosophically, we should only facilitate planning. You should not play God don't go to prescribe plans. So the key thing for us is therefore to look at how do you now get, let's say, start from the ward committees, give them a picture of what all are there. The other question I think we also miss out when it comes to planning is, who should decide the objective of the master planning? As in like, now they're saying that doing this 2031 and 2041, right? What, what do you imagine our 2041 to be? Who should decide that? Who is setting that objective? I can tell you in 2031, I really did want people, uh, the consultants to go out to every planning district, do a stakeholder consultation, ask people what do they imagine their city in 2031, then derive what is the objective of this plan. Unfortunately, that didn't go as desired. 
although I, I, I was the lead author for the TOR for the 2031 master plan, but it never goes that way because the political economy is operating in a very different way. Right? So we, we need to ask those questions and, and the key thing that, I, that hit me was that the law doesn't permit. Right? While we talk of it and we can imagine ways of operationalizing or coming up with methods, how do you want to do it uh, for a different set of things. So we, I, I don't think we have, we lack, uh, in the sense, uh, ideas, people, and uh, today technology and everything is there. The key thing is, I think, uh, we need to see how we get to get to the new law. Now, on that, I think that's that's the key thing uh, that I would want to really look at, and yeah, even including something like Shamita's range and master plan, all it will require. We need we need the law to kind of take care of it. I don't think without having a good law. Uh, will help. But having said that, I think I have one important question for all of you. Uh, I would imagine all of you are in are from Bangalore, right? Yes? Not all. Okay. You have been residing in the city for the last one year? Great. Uh, how many of you know who is your corporator? Which world do you live in? I see only a few hands. Great. Uh, yeah, again, this is very less, as in hardly a handful. So, in my view, this is the tragedy we are living in. Recently, yes. the OB Siddiqui Chair in the History and Culture of Society at NCBS. He has worked on a project to map India's open natural ecosystem. I welcome you, sir. I mean, I uh, wholeheartedly concur with the kind of concerns Sudhir has raised about urban planning and the kind of uh, the 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 gaps that are left in the overlap of jurisdictions, legislations, and, and aspirations, not just of uh, various departments, but also the lack of that you know, among our people and, and the lack of political uh, and, and participation in this entire process of planning. So what I want to talk about today is if you went outside the city, so our focus largely as, I mean, I'm an ecologist, I'm not an architect, so forgive me if I'm coming with wrong assumptions about you, but I would believe that a large part of architects are concerned about built environments, about lived environments, but these are largely cities. I have mostly been interested in what's outside of these. So if you start to look at what are, are largely concerned with these built and lived environments, these are the, are the large cities, the built areas of India. If you looked at, looked at a land cover map, and this is one kind of a lens through which we can look at this entire land. The other is, of course, if you're interested in productive land, productive in the conventional sense of agriculture, which is producing directly out of the land. And if you looked at this country as, as productive land, this is what you would see in terms of agriculture. And note everywhere that there are these blotches of black, and, and they're important. We'll, we'll get to that. Or if you're really interested, like I am, in, in, in natural environments and so on, one of the things we often get very obsessed by and very interested in and think nothing beyond of beyond this in our terrestrial environments are our forests. So we also worry a lot about our forests. We worry about our forests because they're important for wildlife, it's important for water, it's important for climate change, it's important for various things. So we think about this. But that's not all. A large part of what is not built, not cultivated, and not protected as forests, we call, as Sudhir has already said, we call them wastelands. Most of the land that is not built, I'll say it again, not cultivated and not protected as forest in this country is thought of as wasteland. So I think it's important for us to get a sense of where this word, it's not a, this, this idea comes from. Unlike forests, wasteland is not a natural category of land. It is what I would call, it's constructed, it's a normative concept. It's constructed socially and historically. 
In the late 17th century, the English philosopher John Locke held that lands that, are, that existed in a state of nature where people simply enjoyed the fruits of earth. If you just lived on a place and gathered what it could offer you to make a living, he th thought of that as waste. Whereas lands that actually lands gained in value when people applied their labor privately appropriated that land, enclosed it, and intensively cultivated it. Not only did he argue that the wild woods and waste exist on many continents, remember this is the, still the 17th century, 1600s and so on. Not only did he argue that the wild woods and waste exist in many continents, but he also argued that their wasteful use justified that an appropriation by England of that time to give it what he called an improving hand. So these wastelands occurred across the globe and it justified why England should go and lend them an improving hand. So thus he provided a very persuasive and strong rationale for the entire colonial ambition. This is still the, uh, the, the start of the empire. I mean, the imperialism hadn't really uh, expanded into its eventual scope in the early 20th century and it expands and so on. That was the time where, and he said, and I quote, land that is left wholly to nature, that hath no improvement of pasturage, tillage or planting, is called, as it indeed is, waste. We shall find the benefit of it amount to little more than nothing. So this was really what undergirded his aspiration and the justification for the colonial ambition that we can go to any place, whether it's the United States, whether it's North America, whether it's uh, towards the Orient, it's, it's in India and so on, that we could go and improve these waste, wild woods and waste. Thus, wasteland was not as we imagine a category applied to infertile, barren, or rocky lands. It is a social category that applied to supposedly unproductive uses of lands that were put to and lands that were left idle and lands that were left to be in the common. It was not all, both you and I might use it, but it belonged to neither of us. That was also wasteland by his definition. So what this did was this enabled a deeper categorization of people into productive cultivating groups and non-productive groups based on how they use the land. If you grazed buffaloes or sheep, you, you, you didn't count, you were just still, it was, it was wasteful, it was, it was not a use of land. That you needed land, that you produced something out of it did not matter. Only if you privately owned, privately held, enclosed and cultivated intensively, did it become not waste. And all of this was also converted into a generation. If these were values that were being created, it also convert, there was also a conversion of these values into revenue. So, generating values from wastelands was thus the means by which the land, not just the land, but also its inhabitants could be disciplined. We just, we categorized land into waste and, and uh, not waste. Similarly, certain kinds of uses, like I said, of, of pastoral uses of land were wasteful or if you're gathering, it was wasteful. So entire groups of people became persona non grata. We stopped under the colonial regime, we stopped. In, in these parts, we used to have what's called Kumri cultivation, a shifting cultivation that was stopped. Pastoralism, pastoralists were sedentarized. Uses of land that could not be taxed for revenue were stopped. So by and large, settled agri agriculture. And interestingly, forests in the uh, early 19th century were still, when, when the East India Company was, was, was in control, forests were still thought of as wastelands. Forests were wastelands. It was only in the late 19th century in, 18, in 1865, we passed the Indian Forest Act, and only after that was, was there a means to actually control and harness revenue out of forests, as a result of which 
forests were not wasteland anymore. Until then, forests were created out of what the colonialists thought of as wasteland. So this idea of a wasteland, of wastelands, is a deeply colonial concept and dripping in the aspirations of uh, an empire, which we do not have today. But yet, this is what we make of it. Since for the nearly for nearly 40 years, independent India has been continuing this colonial tradition of identifying and calling what constitute probably one third or, or, or a little less of our lands, a fourth of our lands as wastelands. We continue to call and map them as wastelands. So what are these lands and where are they coming from? So into these, so what do you do with something that is waste as was done with the forest? What was done with forests is that these were wastelands, a law was brought, the forests were reserved and then you started saying, okay, this is legally, do you have, a, do you have rights over this? If you don't, sorry, if it's too bad, if you lived here for generations, if you have all the knowledge on how what this place contains, how this functions and what, what uses you can derive of it or what living you can make of it, doesn't matter. It's not yours anymore, it's ours and we have developed this and we are developing this and in the case of forest it was largely drawn through what was called, called in quotes scientific forestry through bringing in of monocultural plantations, intensification of uh, uh, of, of management of forest, extraction of timber. This was the way in which a wasteland was made productive. Now, we have, as I said, all these are wastelands. The different colors, the categories with which Sudhira began, they're all wastelands in our country. And it's a very large fraction of our land. And what do you do with wastelands? You develop them, right? And as, as architects, you're on the forefront of how we think about developing wastelands. So I just gave you a glimpse into where the idea of uh, wastelands comes from and what now we, let's look at what it means to develop. So as Sudhira has said just about our lived and built urban environments if you widen this and start to see what is this that we need what are these lands that we call wastelands and how do we want to develop them there are multiple, it's not one set of aspirations that converge on this land. As a country that uh, where, where we have about 400 people to a square kilometer at, at, the, at the subcontinental scale, it is not easy for us to find land. So here is some land that is being called waste to which everyone is being invited to come in and develop. And we have all our own different plans of what that might involve. In some cases, it might involve just development of you know building, building roads, setting up uh, you know residential or other kinds of developments, and that's the whole template. You can do it pretty much anywhere. You have to solve problems of water, power, all of those things. If you have managed to figure those things out, and technology is great, it allows you to do all that. There's all of this land available, wastelands. You can do all kinds of things with it. So this is one aspiration. Similarly, we are confronting the, the monstrosity of fossil fuel based expansion in our energy needs and if you want to do, uh, if you want to plan development in a way that's more climate friendly and environment friendly, friendly in quotes, then you have to go towards large scale production of renewable energy and large scale production of renewable energy is at colossal scales. So today, the, some of our largest solar farms are la is larger than Bharatpur National Park and this is not one and we are uh, they are expanding at humongous scales and completely obliterating and closing lands and drawing water because they are extremely water intensive to produce that energy to keep the panels clean and so on and then we have a lot of very good insight and technology and, and understanding and science coming into mapping and saying here is the solar potential uh, solar energy potential of this country then to overlay this with the wasteland map, you know where you can generate the best power. You've solved, solved a big problem. On the other hand, you could also be thinking, well, there's, there's also wind. These are open areas. See, these are not, so you can have, you can have wind. So again, a lot of uh, very good scientific input 
can go and engineering imagination can go into converting these areas into things just that just become a way of producing another form of power that is not fossil fuel based renewable so called uh, renewable and therefore so called environmentally friendly but the template of land that is required in order to generate these developments are colossal similarly we have emitted a lot of carbon into the atmosphere we've got to pull the carbon back down and sequester this into some living form no technology however fancy we have uh, been gives you the ability to to pull carbon down and sequester this into living uh, uh, mass like biomass i like trees too so we now want to do we want to these are open areas imagine if this were full of trees and if this were full of trees they could all be you know taking carbon out of the atmosphere and say fixing carbon so there will be less carbon in the atmosphere more trees what a wonderful solution how come nobody thought about it so it's not nature doesn't function in there is a reason a place has grass and no trees there are ecological reasons why places look different that you don't have forests on every square inch of earth or you don't have deserts on every square inch of earth there are climatological there are uh, 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 topographical there are soil related edaphic characteristics that create a, a huge diversity of environments and therefore although we might think that this is a brilliant idea to be you know solve many problems at once where you create forests draw carbon out convert wastelands into a productive use and this is being thought about this is a map of where you could actually restore since you know afforestation is not a very nice word these days we we say restore but we pretty much mean the same thing here is all we could where we could put trees and this is about how much we could uh, add trees no matter that a animal like the black bug that you see there only lives in grasslands it doesn't live in a forest if you're going to uh, convert its uh, the entire area into this you're going to essentially obliterate the only space in which it knows how to live as sudhir was talking about lorises in the city lorises can't cross at traffic traffic junctions they have to use tree canopies to move across similarly a black bug knows only how to live in areas that are open it doesn't know how to live in a forest so off goes the black bug so how do you even begin so you need to begin by changing the entire narrative our idea has been that these are wastelands these are not nothing in nature is waste this is our construct and this is not even our construct it is a construct that enabled the entire colonial expansion that we have so uncritically embraced and are using today to the detriment of our own actual heritage natural and cultural and this is the way we have been trying to uh view and thereby manage our open natural ecosystems these are natural ecosystems that are open and they are foundries of incredible amounts of natural and cultural wealth which i will get to in a moment but you have not ever because again the due to the paucity of laws there is a law the indian forest act said these are forests because we say so under this law and this is how we'll protect them as the forest conservation act of the 1980 of 1980 said this is how we'll conserve them we don't even recognize the existence of open natural ecosystems we just call them wastelands so there's no question of asking how can we protect these because protection is not even an issue development is the issue not protection but these are productive lands as they are they are ecologically productive they are culturally productive they are productive in terms of livelihoods of people and it is our inability to see this in front of our eyes but rather embrace an outdated colonial notion of what is a wasteland and use it uh, in 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 a current context that is really leading down a path that we must greatly question so we made a map trying to show what are actually the remaining the remnants of open natural ecosystems that one must keep in mind if you were to be building a solar a solar farm or proposing a solar farm a development an urban development a tree plantation or whatever a tree planting program where would you not go where should you not be going if you cared about ecology 
there was no map and this is an early effort that we made which we have subsequently followed up and tried to see that there are like i said it's not one kind of an ecosystem there are multiple kinds of ecosystems that you see at the bottom right and their distribution is something we tried to map and just to give you a glimpse this is how open natural ecosystems look if I, these are just a set of thumbnails that i've got out of google earth this is the diversity. This is just a small sample of the diversity of open natural ecosystems that we have in our country, which is no less astonishing than our diverse kinds of forests, be it from mangroves to uh, yeah, needle leaf forests and white evergreen forests. We have such a variety of forests. We have an equally, perhaps even more dazzling variety of open natural ecosystems in our country. And these are not and, and on the ground, they would look like this. They, they range from dunes and open woodland savanna, grasslands and lateritic plateaus. They are astonishing places. And it's been found that it's some of the, uh, uh, in recent times, some of the, uh, uh, the, the uh, newest discoveries of plant species have come from these ecosystems, not from our forests and so on. And there are species that don't live anywhere else, like the black buck that I talked to you about. There is the toad-headed lizard, or it's the wolf, or now cheetah is all the rage. The reason cheetahs developed, they disappeared from this country was hunting. And to a large extent, their natural landscapes in which they lived, in which, across which they ran, on which they had prey, were all being converted in one way or another. They were all wastelands that are cheetah in which we have derived so much pride today and so much political mileage is a species of the wastelands of India. So we would like to call it wastelands and keep giving it away for other kinds of things. At the same time, we would like to say cheetah is going to rest of grasslands, but how? So this is the, uh, the Florican, which lives nowhere else and it has disappeared on large parts of our country. And I think I can't finish without talking about one species. This is the great Indian bustard. 30 years ago, we probably had uh, about a couple of thousand, 30, 40 years ago, we probably had a couple of thousand, certainly over a thousand of these birds. Today, we have probably about a hundred. And these birds are large, uh, among the largest flying birds. They're absolutely unique to the Indian subcontinent. If you want, if you want, if you're feeling really patriotic, you can't think of anything better to symbolize your patriotism around than this species. It occurs nowhere on earth. If this is something quintessentially Indian that you want to protect, there are just hundred of them. Can we do something about it? Let's see what it lives only in wastelands. Can we see what we are doing to its habitat? This is in the remaining habitats of the, uh, the habitats of the remaining hundred bustards. This is how it looks like. This is an actual photograph taken by a person who works there in bustard habitats. This is what we are doing to bustard habitats. And this is not merely an interesting picture. This has consequences. The biggest source of mortality of bustards today. Bustards are not getting hunted. Bustard eggs are not getting trampled upon by cattle. That is not how bustards are dying. Bustards are dying because they collide with power lines. This is a consequence of our development choices. These are not inert. The development choices we are making are not inert. I have so far talked only about ecology. But let's also not forget that these open natural ecosystems are open in another very important way. They have been commons. They have been areas that are not owned by any in one single individual. So there have been very complex traditions of how do you use such a bare and and, uh, and and hostile environment for productive uses. There have been a lot of cultural institutions and practices that have allowed the use of these lands by people in extraordinary ways that have permitted a range of extraordinary livelihoods to emerge. Extremely, the kachi embroidery that you see and that they think is of so beautiful comes only from the pastoral people. This is how they make a living. So they, they, and so many of these livelihoods, it is said that about a third of our country depends on our open natural ecosystems. And there are these increasingly marginalized livelihoods 
and these areas that have been held in common, managed in common through traditions and cultures that are extremely complex, rich and, 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 and varied are all at risk today because of what we think of is waste and what we think of is development. I'm sorry. introduce our third panelist, Dr. Sheshadri K.S., BST Inspire faculty, Ashok Trust for Research and Ecology and the Environment Bangalore. Dr. Sheshadri is focused on understanding and conserving biodiversities. He grew up in Bangalore and has spent over decades in the field of observing nature. Over the year, he has studied several ecosystems ranging from dragonflies in Bangalore to appetites in tall forest canopies in Western Ghats. During his PhD at the National University of Singapore, NUS, he described new species as well, new reproductive behavior of frogs while studying the evolutionary ecology of amphibian behavior. I would welcome you on stage, sir. Incidentally, one of the species that I ended up describing is from the quintessential wastelands from near Manipal. It's a, it's a laterite rock, rock formation where a colleague of mine who was leading the citizen science research heard frog calls and he approached us and we were like, yeah, it's not a frog, might not be a frog. And then he sent us videos of it and that's when we were like, okay, this, is, this doesn't fit any of the known species and we described it as microhyla laterite to draw some attention to the habitat. Will that help save the landscape? I don't know. But today's talk is going to be about, uh, I'm tearing a page out of the what it takes to save a landscape uh, playbook. If some of you have tried doing such things, it will all sound familiar to you. Uh, I'll, I'll touch upon why why Hesergata and why, why it's such a challenge to even talk about or think about saving this landscape. And I don't have to go on too much into the details because Madhu and Sudhira have done an excellent job of introducing both the systems here, the city as well as open natural landscapes. And for those of you who are not familiar with Bangalore, Hesagrata is this lake which is north east of Bangalore. Uh, it's about 20, 20, 25 kilometers depending on where you live in the city. It's a long lake. Uh, it's a man-made reservoir. It's built on the river Akavati. Uh, and, and in, in where Hesergita is, near the village, there's a temple where there's a, they recently found a stone inscription that is at least a thousand years old, which mentions the river presence of the river Arkavati. And the river eventually goes and joins the Kaveri, but Rishbhavati goes and joins Arkavati and they flow into the Kaveri Basin. Uh, in the 60s, there used to be, Bangalore used to get its water supply from Hesergita River or the Hesergita Reservoir. Uh, 500 years of history at least. Uh, this is this should be 1000, but we've known about this landscape for at least there are written records of this landscape and the river uh, sustaining the population around this area for at least 500 years. There's a bit of history about who built the first reservoir and, and these lakes are, I said they're, they are man-made lakes and they are basically embankments along the stream, you know, you know in the watershed. And, Bangalore, if you if, uh, if you haven't looked at it, go and look at Google Earth and see how many lakes there are in the landscape. You can go as back as 1985 on Google Earth easily. Uh, this is one lake that used to supply water to Bangalore, and it, it also supported a colony uh, which was around the around the village, as are most civilizations, depending on water. This one also had a lot of people living around, and it used to be called Shivana Samudra Grahara. So that's a bit of history of the background, and of course, my namesake uh, Sheshadri Ayer uh, increased the height of the dam, and eventually the water was being supplied to Bangalore. And now we don't get water from Hesergata. Hesergata used to be dry for a really long time, and this year, after close to 30 years or 20 years, the lake is full capacity. And if we think about it carefully, and if we plan about plan this whole thing carefully, we might actually be getting some more water security for the city. Right now we get water from the Kaveri, which is like 100 kilometers away. Apart from the lake, there's also this incredibly beautiful and diverse uh, landmass around, which, are, which we call the Hesagata grasslands. It's about 345 acres. It's around where the 
I can show it to you on a map in the next few slides, but it's around the lake. Uh, these are also the parts of the grassland are also floodplains where when the water swells, it, the water brings in nutrients and the water shrinks in summer and all the nutrients left behind are a good source for grasses to grow. And we have heard from Madhu about how grasses themselves are really good habitats also and I'll show you a few examples. This piece of, this particular parcel of land was, uh, is now a grassland, it's the only last remaining patch of grasslands in Bangalore in, in the native habitat. So if you went back say maybe even 70, 80 years ago, parts of Bangalore used to be this kind of landscape. There was a film development corp corporation that was on lease, they were using this land and they eventually shut down and they gave it to Kantirava Studios and they would let this place out for a movie screen, movie shooting and they would, these would eventually end up with a lot of trash that would get thrown around. And in 2012, there was a plan to, or there was a conversation, a discourse to try and get a film city to be set up there because it's wasteland. Nobody's using it, well, you can't grow anything there, so let's, let's build a film city and it's been on and off, it's been, there's a proposal that comes up, it gets shot down and it keeps going back and forth. And of course, grasses are incredibly good at capturing carbon. Uh, Madhu said biomass and biomass is basically plants photosynthesized. The plant material that you see is biomass and that a large proportion of that is carbon and these grasses, although the grasses have a short length above ground, their roots are really long and they tend to hold a lot of carbon. So essentially grasses are probably even better than your trees in holding, capturing and holding carbon in the soil. Apart from that, they also sustain biodiversity. This is one of the, this is not Hesergata, but this is the habitat of the lesser florican. Somewhere in this grass is a breeding pair of lesser florican and these, these birds are the size of a chicken and the male, the photo which Madhu showed, black and white and they have a kind of a streamer on their head and they jump into the air, they flutter and they fall back. Once they fall into the grass, it's very hard to spot them and it's probably evolved in a way, the display is probably evolved in a way to live and breed in these kind of habitats. Apart from that, you have an incredible uh, variety of diversity ranging from amphibians to birds to plants and insects. And in the Hesergata landscape, some of us uh, got together and did a survey of what biodiversity is found there and you can immediately see there's a lot of species of birds, 264 as we know, about 100 species of butterflies, about 395 insects. Spiders are very low, it's probably because we don't have spider experts, none of us know how many spiders are out there. Now we have resources so that anyone can go and look at it, but back in 2012 when we did this report, it was very hard to go look for spiders and all that. Of course, there are different kinds of plants and these are native plants, not the, not the planted ones that are found. You have mammals also, sometimes there's an occasional leopard that walks into the habitat and you have, you have creatures like the slender loris that are found there. Uh, some, some examples of species, this is a recent uh, addition to the list of species, it's, a, it's, a, it's called a smooth-coated otter. These are riverine mammals, they live in rivers and they feed on fish and one of them showed up in Hesergata. Uh, there's one more individual that hangs around in IAC. How they got there, we have no idea, but it's a sign that if we can do something and protect these open natural landscapes, we might be bringing back biodiversity that probably was lost along the way. This is a butterfly we encountered while doing the surveys. It's called a lilac silver line. Why should a butterfly be special? This was sighted after nearly 130 years. It was a species known from this landscape, described from a village called Soldev Nahalli. And for 130 years, nobody had really spotted this species again. And while we were doing the surveys, we encountered this species in what is called the type locality, Soldev Nadi. This is the Lesser Florican. Again, uh, a bird watcher spotted this in 2012. And it was reported from Bangalore after exactly 100 years. There's one report of the Lesser Florican being hunted in Bangalore, uh, near the Hebal military grassland area. And this sighting is important because it shows that even that 365 hectares of acres of grassland is still important and can sustain populations of endangered species. And of course, you have mammals that are nocturnal. This is a slender loris. It's a primate, so we have mentioned about it. And, and having these kind of Hesergata-like landscapes are important because it serves as an important source. It serves as a source population where individuals, when you choose or when you can reconnect these habitats, fragmented habitats, they'll serve as a source population where you could facilitate gene flow and all that. And we know that gene flow is important, otherwise there are consequences of 
in breeding within animal populations. And of course, Hesarkata is great for insects. Uh, a lot of the a lot of the students from GKVK go on has go to Hesarkata for their field sites. This is a species of an insect that was described from Hesarkata. This is just one example. There are they've described nearly 70 species from Hesarkata itself. Just a small piece of graph. All is not well. There are threats to these landscapes, and I've, I've broadly categorized them into two classes. One is the local scape, which are emerging plantations, and in this case, photographers. And in the landscape scale, you have the urban sprawl and general neglect of the landscape itself. And over and above this, there's an overarching theme that has probably emerged in, in the conversation we have had today is I would, what I would call evidence denialism or science denialism. Science tells us something, and we choose to deny that and continue with business as usual. And that's a larger threat, and I'm not going to list it out here, because it's true for anything in ecology these days. I'll start with the plantation drive that happened, and Madhu has set the stage for it, so I don't need to give you the context. Uh, nearly 30,000 sampling, saplings were planted along the shoreline of the lake. When the, sh when the water levels reduced, they decided that, oh, there's nothing growing here, let's put some trees. The native scrub jungle was bulldozed. They went in with JCBs, they bulldozed the native scrub habitat, where you have birds and lorises and other mammals that are living. And they chose to, chose to plant native trees, from possibly from the western bats, in a dry habitat. And they dig these pits, and you can actually see them from satellite images. This is the eastern bank of the lake. You, there's an access point here, and this area is what I want you to look at. And you'll see, oh, Shakti, I need to zoom in here, but you'll see a lot of these uh, pitted patterns there, and these are all plantations that were dug in, saplings were planted. Some trees have survived to grow, but a lot of them have died because the water levels rose, and they've created these beautiful habitats for frogs. Is that, a, is that necessarily a good thing? Is that an intended consequence of it? We don't really know. And we need to see what's going to happen. And these are frog eggs, just to show you the scale. The other threat that we saw when we started studying this landscape was nature photographers. Nature photographers, nature enthusiasts love going out there. They love nature. And they often tend to go overboard. Everything goes to 11 sometimes. and. We saw people with cars chasing wildlife. This is a jackal being chased in a SUV. And of course, we went on subsequent bird watching outings and we saw that there were more cars than birds. And people were driving their cars around on the lake bed in the grassland, uh, stalking birds, chasing them till they, they got, possibly got exhausted and fell down, the birds, not the photographers. And, and they would go through all kinds of habitats where the birds would be nesting, the grass would be sourced for insects, and the insects are prey for birds. So there's an ecological food web that's going on, and driving around essentially changes things. Why do, why do they go in cars? Some people said the birds are less likely to fly away because they don't perceive a car as a threat. Uh, photographers are lazy, possibly. Uh, and, and many a times we ran into people who didn't know that it was wrong. They're like, oh, everyone's doing it, I'm doing it, I didn't know. And of course, there were some who, who still don't care. I still know people. And, and if you notice, we have masked people because I, I grew up bird watching and I know a lot of these people. So we decided not to name names and black talk people, but people in there know who they are. And what we did was try and it was kind of a student project. We went with a bunch of students from St. Joseph's and tried to quantify how much habitat is damaged because of photographers. And we, we put a measuring scale of a known length, and we took pictures perpendicular to the measuring tape. And using what is called a pixel counter, it's a software tool, you can count the number of pixels in a given area. So from this area to this area, because we know how long the tape is, and we know how far we took the picture from, you can calculate how much area is lost because of the two wheels passing through. And you can see here a lot of the, this was an aqueduct. There was a waterway there, and vehicles seem to keep moving up and down. And there's some numbers there. Average number of vehicles was 20. Uh, 3.5 hours is what each photographer would spend chasing birds in the mornings and in the evenings. Uh, we sampled at 77 points along the lake. And we measured close to 43 kilometers of tracks inside the lake, inside the lake bed. And remember, the lake is only 20 kilometers from the city of Bang. So it, it, there are more tracks inside the lake than how far it is from the city itself. And we, we computed how much area might be lost because of vehicles and all that. Roads also cause what is called a barrier effect. 
uh, animals and birds do not tend to cross roads. There's also road mortality. Animals get killed. They get run over. If there are nesting birds, they get run over. And there are other uh, cascading consequences of these vehicles moving around. And these are some of the things we wanted to highlight. And we ended up putting a white paper of sorts. So it was not a paper published anywhere. We put the report out online. And we highlighted these issues and uh, talked about what are the potential ways in which we can protect this landscape. And that's essentially when we also started thinking about protecting this landscape in, in general across the across the lake itself and not 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 just the lake bed. Uh, moving to another threat, which is urban sprawl, city is growing. Sudhira showed images of how the Bangalore city has expanded, and you can see this is an image. Uh, I don't know if the numbers are visible there. But you can see this is this is the city of Bangalore, uh, and this is Tikkurnahalli, and this is Hesargatta. And you can see over years, I've, I've taken it at 10 decade intervals, and you can see the city has already started expanding. 10 more years, and you can see the gray area is much larger, and Hesargatta is still there. And this is, I think, the most recent where the city and Hesargatta are not that that far apart at all. It used to be a far, it used to be a day trip when I started bird watching to go to Hesargatta, and today you can get there. And, less than an hour. And, and the city is expanding. So with the city changing, there's also landscape that is changing. People are selling off their agriculture lands. The apartments are being built. Roads are being expanded. So there are a lot of uh, cascading effects of urban sprawl itself. People who used to be pastoralists have started settling down. They've sold their sheep and cattle. They've moved to a permanent house structure and all of those things. And that's happening. That's, that's going to affect this landscape really soon. And we have to protect some of this, we should act now. And this is the most recent one, as of, I think, February this year. You can see it's almost gray here as well. There's also development that's happening. Roads are expanding, I said. This is not from Aysargitta, this is from Ramnagra, but I use the image to show what's happening here. This is the northern end of Aysargitta Lake, and this is the Madurai Kere Road, which is being doubled. This used to be lined with at least 150-year-old trees. And they've all cleared it and they've expanded the highway. And there's a recent news article that also mentions why Hesargata is in the news. Uh, a lot of, there's been a lot of opposition to protect this place, despite evidence that it's important. And one of the things they highlight is there are potentially roads that are going to come up in this region and land values are going to go up and people don't want them to be protected in any form. There's a lot of things at play here. What do we stand to lose? Of course, there's biodiversity, and uh, we've talked about, and one of the things that come up with any opposition to conservation is, oh, it's just birds, they'll fly away somewhere else. And we've seen from uh, pictures that Madhu showed that there are there are barriers for birds to move as well. There are power lines. Birds get pushed to what we call suboptimal habitats. It's true that birds can fly, but then Hesargata is ruined, Tipkornali is ruined, Hebal is ruined. Where else is the bird going to go? They're going to settle down in habitats which have less food, which have fewer resources, and this will have longer term consequences on populations that are going to decline. So if a bird was going to have two chicks in one season, they might end up having one or none at all, because the resources are not enough to sustain a viable population. You also have what is called an ecological collapse. Uh, it's like it's like there is this uh, there's a rivet hypothesis. If you can think of species as rivets that are holding an airplane, and the airplane is hurtling up in 35,000 feet. You start pulling out one rivet at a time. Each of the rivet is a species. The plane still keeps flying. You pull 20 out, the plane still flies. You pull the 40, 40th one out, it still flies. Maybe the 41st one that you pull might be the critical link that will lead to the plane to collapse. And these are these are real things that can happen in ecological systems. And therefore, we ought to be protecting uh, biodiversity. Of course, water security is an important thing. Uh, Bangalore is growing, and with the population, we already know there's water crunch. And I see, like this is this is November. I already see a lot of water trucks around my house, not far from here. So water crisis is an important thing, and Hesargata can sustain a lot of water. It can hold up to it's about six feet in the deepest part. If you desilt it and uh, rejuvenate it, you can get a lot more water to store there. There's also this old aqueduct system that's already existing. All we have to do is think about, imagine, reimagine our city in a way where we are more sustainable, have water close to ourselves and not pump it from 100 kilometers away. 
And of course, there's a lot of campaign to revive the river Arkavati itself. A lot of money got spent. A lot of the local politicians were involved in the campaigns. But then, as is often the case, they don't walk the talk with uh, conservation here. This is a map made by Sudhira. This is the watershed of the Hesergata River, uh, Hesergata Lake, uh, along the Arkavati catchment. And you can see it can hold up to 97.5 million liters per day. That's a lot of water that can offset the pressure on the city. And all we have to do is reimagine protecting this watershed and making sure that the city has some water to move forward. And of course, there are bioresources. And I'll spend a little bit of the time because it's a fascinating case. And it came from an entomologist uh, who's, who had the vision of using an insect that was found and described from Hesergata in controlling a pest in the United States. And it's often used in textbooks as a landmark case of biocontrol. This is the insect. It's called Neodusmeta sanguani. It's a tiny parasitoid wasp. These wasps lay their eggs on other insects. The wasp eggs hatch. They eat the other insect and then emerge as a little adult. These are it's, it's about a millimeter long. And this is Subarao, Dr. Subarao, who used to be at the entomology institution. And he now, I mean, he moved to London and he was a referee in the Wimbledon Championships. Is a tennis uh, referee and all that. Uh, when he when he came upon the species, there was the, when he was when he was in the in the tennis turf business, uh, there was this insect called a mealybug. It's a scale insect. You would have seen white things on plants around your houses, and these were attacking the grasses that are growing. And this grass was important for the cattle ranching industry and the golf industry and lawns and city maintenance work. They didn't know how to control this, and uh, Superall ended up introducing this insect in the United States in Texas mostly, to control the road grass uh, population. And it worked wonderfully to the fact that there were papers written where they did the math on how much money they were going to save by introducing this one little tiny parasitoid from Hesergata. And it went on to save a lot of money for a lot of people. And these are potential bioresources that might be there waiting to be discovered. If we can protect these grasslands, we can protect these lakes as they are. And of course, people have a major role to play. This is, uh, these are colleagues of my friend Mahesh, who was involved in rejuvenating part of the lake, where they dug up an old aqueduct, an inlet basically into the lake. It was closed up for 15 years, and they started digging it up. And for the first time in 15 years, water started flowing through. And this was a people's movement. People wanted to save the Arkavati River, and they got together and did it. Could they have done it legally? I don't know. But it's just a bunch of people who got around to they saw what had to be done and they went and did it. So there was a lot of leadership locally. Uh, and at this point is when we started talking, Mahesh, uh, uh, Ramki and I started thinking about putting a proposal to declare it as a, get it declared as a conservation reserve. And we called it the Greater Hesergata Conservation Reserve. The proposal was submitted to the Forest Department, Department in 2013. It came up to hearing only last year. Uh, conservation reserve is a way of a protected area within the Wildlife Protection Act that doesn't it, it, it's a provision to protect land that's owned by the government. It doesn't exclude the rights of people. People don't get kicked out of the landscape and all that. And Karnataka has several examples of conservation reserves also. This is the map made by the Forest Department based on our proposal. And it shows all the green area that we see. That's the scrub jungle grassland habitat, which is currently owned by the government. There are uh, animal husbandry. Uh, Poultry Development Office, and there are a bunch of animal husbandry uh, offices there, and they own this grassland. They use it for research, cattle research, and all that. And this is essentially the area that we are proposing to have it declared as a conservation reserve, and it amounts to about 5,100 hectares. It's a large parcel of land, and it's in the watershed of the lake itself. Wisdom tells us that it's good, but then when, when the proposal came up for hearing, there was a lot of opposition from the people. And one of the one of the funnier ones was, oh, if you protect this into a conservation reserve, they'll bring the cheetah and release it here. So there's a lot of misinformation that got fed into people's minds. And uh, one of the things that the ministers also started talking was, oh, this is grassland. There's no wildlife here. And of course, we have seen how important grasslands can be. And I'm kind of preaching the choir here, but uh, bear with me. Uh, the other thing was people will get evicted. It doesn't really happen because a lot of the land is already owned by the government and it's already illegal for us to go and do anything there. Cattle herders still go there, fishermen still go there, there are contracts given to the fishermen. 
those things will continue if it's a conservation reserve. There will also be a local committee which will work with the forest department and the local panchayat in managing the rules if and when the conservation reserve gets declared. Roads will be closed is another thing that got uh, pushed out and it doesn't really matter. We are not even in the map, the roads are not even in, in part of the landscape. And the other other thing, I don't know if I've mentioned it here, yeah, eco-sensitive zones will be declared around the conservation reserve. And again, that's not a that's not a realistic thing that's gonna happen. Because the provision of conservation reserve is only for government owned land around or, or where there are important wildlife habitats. And dealing with the science denialism is hard. One of it is the print media and, and of course the news outlets. They've been really kind about the issue, but there are also several online uh, news portals now which are peddling a lot of the misconceptions and scaring people. There's a lot of fear mongering that's happening. And I think effort should happen at the local scale where we talk to the people and convince them. We're slowly working on it. The story so far is that the proposal came up for hearing, it got shot down. And then the court, we went to court and the court said, no, hear it again. And this time they opened it for public consultation. So people are being consulted. There's a stakeholder meeting that's going to happen. And we look forward to what's going to happen with this landscape. Uh, this is just a summary of why we ought to protect the Hesergata landscape. Uh, I, won't, I won't read each one of them, but I think from the discussions, you already know why we need these open habitats. And, but, but my intention of giving this talk was to give you a flavor of how it's also a challenge to get something done. And I should, I should thank Mahesh, uh, who is a faculty at Srishti uh, Manipal Institute of Design, uh, who, is, who lives in Esargata, who has faced a lot of backlash from the local landscape when he tried to conserve this habitat, and he still, still keeps going at it. And of course, Ramki, who pushed the proposal at multiple levels. Shamal, an entomologist who helped me with resources on looking at these insects. And of course, there are uh, close to 100 people involved in this campaigns that we did trying to get this landscape protected. And, I should thank them and I thank you all for inviting the ecologist to an architectural institution and talk about ecology. Thank you. And now we will uh, move on forward to the moderation session where I'll introduce our moderator of the day today. Architect Vagish Nagarur. Architect, he is an architect and a landscape designer at Design Grounds Bangalore. Architect Vagish graduated from SEPT Ahmedabad in 1997. He completed his post-graduation in landscape architecture from SEPT in 2022. He had a long-term association in teaching since 2001, first as a faculty in postgraduate landscape architecture program at SEPT and later as a faculty at RBCA. He has been associated with several firms in architecture, consulting landscape architect, and member of master master planning teams with architectures form like Biohome Architects, Flying Elephant Studio, Space Metrics, and SCE Consultant at Bangalore. He al also worked with Gujri, uh, Gurjit Singh Matharu Architects and DPC Consultants in Ahmedabad. I would request her to please join us on stage. Uh, also, I would request our three panelists to please join us. More than I open it was like a warning actually. So I should also thank the organizers putting up this team. In fact, I was also thinking that much of it is uh, obviously possible because it's like a warning. Awareness building at all levels is important. So in fact, I would say more such people of experts of these related fields and beyond our related fields should in fact participate in our first year program actually. That's when you can tweak and inculcate values. It, ultimately it's all related to the values that you build up and which will take you down in your uh, areas of expertise or direction that you take. Only English generation are open to Research. They are quite enthusiastic. There is no problem with them actually. So all the three speakers, it was so you know uh, 
uh, in sync actually. They were like puzzle which fell together, you know, at different scales and in different zones. So this is really nice actually. So anyway, the coming down to the uh, <laughs> the intent of this uh, seminar, ultimately it is about the built environment versus the grave danger of settlement that <coughs> throws open and which will affect yeah, yeah. that throws open a lot of disaster situations so I think the churning is towards what is the possibility what where each one can have a role that's why also so start with I uh, would just I recall this uh, as uh, you must be knowing it the Stavarak Kali to Jangama Kali Villa. Uh, it's a like 12th century poet, philosopher, religious pontiff. What is static will perish, what is transient will survive. You know? I think that's the crux, I think way back he told it. And unfortunately, architecture is static. <laughs> so that is a you know, that is a challenge that comes to whether it is cities, whether it is buildings, what creative directions the people can take. You know, that's a kind of uh, challenge will be in this uh, discussion. Other thing that came up uh, was, uh, uh, the other thing that I can link is uh, this V.S. Naipaul's uh, India Wounded Civilization because uh, they refer to uh, uh, especially uh, Sudhira referred to a lot of colonial links and same laws trickling down till them. Their classification, even uh, Sir mentioned, a lot of uh, a classification of land and which came down from colonial hangover and then uh, it still now has not, not only in the environmental field, every field, whether it is legal, criminal, it has even education, uh, writing history, everything it has come down from them, I think. We are all the same. So now I just want to pose this question that uh, what are the bottlenecks where a legal framework which is concerned towards ecologically balanced cities is facing? I just would like you you would like to throw out. What are the bottlenecks and what are the any hope is there in the near future? I would like to see positives and negatives. Both you should throw a light. Thank you, I guess uh, it's a very, very good and pointed question. Uh, like I tried to articulate when I spoke, I think the key bottleneck is the Karnataka, existing version of the Karnataka Town and Planning Act of 1962. So incidentally, around 2013-14, I had a chance to review other state master planning acts and discovered that all of them are similar just that there are some variations in the wordings and incidentally those of you from my practice in Karnataka uh, you will see that we have very like less or no town planning schemes as you would see in Bombay presidency like Gujarat Maharashtra will, you will see a lot of, lot of town planning schemes that are already there like for instance Sholapur has even places like Sholapur or any other, other cities in Maharashtra and Gujarat you will see town planning schemes in effect and we don't have anything like that in, in Karnataka in that sense. We are all happy with our master plans. But uh, I think the key to impediment, impediment is the way certain sections in the existing version of the Karnataka Town and Country Planning Act, particularly I think 4, 9, or all of them are, 30, are very prescriptive in saying what should be the outcome of the master planning exercise. And that I think is very regressive or very constrained uh, in, in keeping up with the current aspirations and expectations that all of us try to bring about. So the key challenge therefore I think is one engage with policy makers but as you know uh, engaging with policy makers alone will not happen because you will also need greater larger public to appreciate what it is. And for which I guess uh, like you also pointed out we will need more citizen engagement and only with greater citizen engagement we can have more dialogue with that how do we need to have, think about new law. So I am not going to buy like even in, in the works that I do, I am only saying we need a new planning law. There is like for instance you could to take a look at the reference of uh, the new spatial planning act that the Dutch government brought in 2008 
they're already good as in the product has uh, very nice uh, acts as in and they also revised and have a new planning act and special planning act in 2008 so there are things like that we can look at it but i don't, I don't want to go up, go out there because i think we have different needs different aspirations different settings and based on that we may have to re-look at it so the possibility is that we'll have to re-look at and arrive at a new planning act and for which uh, our honourable legislatures have to do. And jokingly, I also often say in Bangalore we have 28 assembly constituencies, and of the 28, more than 14 of them officially are in real estate. So yeah. we are also say we also say we are in the Republic of Real Estate yeah. Developers. So it's, the challenge is now how do you work with the, in the Republic of Real Estate Developers to get a new act? Yeah, I think that was a hard hitting <laughs> answer. I think that's much of the truth comes out of the last sentence that is said. Um, what they call fence itself will consume <laughs> daily a lot of your thing in Canada it's called if you know Canada yeah. it's like fence yeah. itself is yeah. consumer so okay now coming to so I teach uh, Hello, uh, no kind of yeah yeah okay <laughs> so I teach uh, I'll just come back to I'll just put a question to you so I teach uh, site planning to master uh, this thing and there's a word that we use it uh, in that lens that when you make a master plan uh, at least in site planning, there is a particular word that we use which is appreciated that it is a conscious neglect. So you leave a land as uh, open, untouched. So you don't have to cl always classify it as zone for academic, zones for hostel, zone for playground. Certain land, especially large, larger class of land, we leave it as a conscious neglect. And there is a value to it. And we teach it as a part of master planning strategy. So now, when I look at the ecological value that you said about the grasslands which are untouched, you don't have to do anything. Just leave it as it is and don't interfere with it much. And we also learned from certain uh, movies recently which has become a big hit. I hope people get value rather than just a you know, drama of it. I hope they get it. <laughs> so, when I look at that, there are traditional examples in our own settlement patterns. There are sacred groves left, Nagarkattis are left, there are grazing lands which are actually grasslands. They are maybe just left for cows to graze, you know, laze around. Maybe certain part of the, some fair happens and again land recovers. How come we completely you know, not learned that balance that it had with the settlement and that land has an ecological value also. It was there part of our village and smaller settlements and the newer ones has completely lost. How come we, is there a hope of learning from it and integrating into the things to get the ecological value within our settlement? Any hope or any example that you found, you can tell me. Uh, I left. Uh, first, I mean, I'd like to respond to one of the things you said about just the the idea of conscious neglect. And I think um, it's it's important, of course. But I think what is perhaps more appropriate in the context of our uh, of our natural landscapes, particularly of the kind I've been talking about, is that it's not conscious neglect, but I think it's a very enlightened relationship with the land. Yeah. It's not neglect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There have been people of communities, ways of living, that have a, that use this land, that consume resources that these lands offer, but they do so with a very deep understanding of the scope of that activity as well as its limits that you can't do something indefinitely that there are boundaries that you know how to i can't you mean i mean i may not be able to give you a report but i can tell you where the boundaries are and when we are crossing boundaries and how to pull back these i think this i think is i, I would put it one step beyond neglect that we have a very enlightened engagement rather than a conscious neglect i think what we've that is really something that we've lost. And to the question of uh, uh, 
I'm sorry, the, the, the latter part. Yeah, is, what I'm asking, is there any pattern or any solution that you've seen or example or any uh, something that theoretically you can see that can be done like this? Adopt that traditional system. So I think I think as the as the frontier, as the boundary of the city has expanded. So yeah. there is I, there has always been the uh, the divide between the urban and the rural. And I think this is not merely, uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's a divide of multiple kinds. We live in a very stratified society, so yeah, mapping on to that division between urban and rural, it's not merely in terms of ecology and relationship to land and water and so on, the differences are there. It's there entirely in terms of communities and all of that. I think one of the unfortunate ways in which the meeting, the interface between what is the built urban environment and the less built rural environment or a production frontier or a protection frontier where you're where the, to uh, expand this idea uh, a bit more, the areas of conscious neglect, mm. if you are really talking about say a grassland or a forest, a hazard or something, to leave it alone, to let it be. So there, I think, what is very clear, and the word that hasn't gone around today in this room, but much, is that all of the change that we see in terms of how we develop and the choices we make are dictated by power. We mentioned real estate. It is dictated by power, and the power today to make, and, the, uh, and, and if you look at how the power flows, it's generally been from the dwellers of the urban built environments to the recipients of other environments. So it's like, therefore, the only version of development that we can get through this power structure is an expansion of the city, not an imbibing of ideas from the other side. How do you actually know limits? How do you incorporate limits into, your, into the way? We don't take things from, so those are backward. They are rural. They are not landscapes from which you learn. These are places in, in which you go and develop. These are people you educate. They are, those, the transformation is from the urban to the rural. That is the way the direction in, that's the direction in which power flows. And that has seriously limited the huge opportunities there have been of learning. How do you actually function within limits? How do you organize your own society to operate within the limits that nature draws? What are those limits? How do you remain in contact with that? These are things that I don't think urban dwellers are very distinguished or renowned for living within the limits of ecology or nature. But people who are much more closely interfacing with ecology and nature are the ones who have a much more robust sense of this. And we've foreclosed, you know, in the way we have built our power structures, we have closed all opportunities by which we can learn in this direction. And I think that's a very big loss. It's not going to be, I can say various things, but what is going to be the mechanism by which we are actually going to sit at the feet of our uh, um, so-called uneducated people who are, you know, who live in rural areas and learn about a few relationships with nature. And how do our planners do it? Yeah. They are, I mean, it's, that's not the way things work. I think that's what is desperately needed and is perhaps realistically very hard to achieve. Yeah. Because yeah, thanks for that. I just wanted to add on to what Madhu said. I think uh, without any uh, ill intentions to the professions we are in. Uh, as in, I'm trained as an engineer, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, but thankfully I had uh, other exposures. Like if you saw what I spoke with, and I, I hope you would not realize that I'm an engineer in that sense, or 10 years ago I would run you through simulations and all of that. But I'm keeping that apart because uh, I think what is important, like particularly for students and learners is, is a, so a sort of be sensitive and uh, empathize. In fact, on the exclusion that Madhu also and you brought it, we are like if you look at master plans, we don't. I don't think any master plan 
depicts localities that are slums. No master plan I have seen that says these are slums. They're formally excluded. I think that's where I think we, we need as, as, as professionals, right? I think with engineering or perhaps even with architecture and all of our professions, we are introduced to the idea of controlling. Or I think that, that sort of a unlearning needs to happen and sort of, uh, like what Madhu said, sit with people. I think we need to empathize with people, empathize with ecology and, and understand or broaden our horizons and then hopefully we will be able to look at things better. I think, I guess that's, that's, that's some uh, unlearning that we need to do and I, I'd like to recollect what Professor Michael Batty says, the more we learn, the less we would want to intervene, but in more meaningful ways. Uh, increasingly, I think uh, we cannot deny that our uh, value system has become more consumer driven. Uh, obviously, there will be a way to look at it. So, the same attitude comes in every patch of land is used, it is developed, it is, you know, has a, you know, it has to bring sort of monetary value to it. So, those drive a lot of decisions. Now, same thing has trickled down to even development of what we call as Bangalore Lake systems. I think it was a nice article, I don't know, it was Leo Sardana or something, maybe you can throw light on that, but you know, he, uh, I don't know who is the person who told that, but it was a nice article, I really value that. So, the increasingly municipality or local government or BD, whichever the agency it is, they started developing lake as a recreational place. You know, it has lost its ecological so, for the common public, okay, there's development happening. They will find, okay, local corporate is taking a lot of initiative. It's an eye wash, actually. I find it. So, the lakes which can have an ecological value. Okay, certain edge, small part, you can use it for public play, small edge, but it can be minimized as much as possible. But the, if you pave it, you, you know, you make a development all around the edge, a certain part will leave it for nature. So, I would like you know, sir, to talk about that issue, you know, how lake, because you talked about lake, that disaster that's happening in the Bangalore and, you know, what are the future or any possibility that you can throw on that lake? It's an interesting question and I haven't, uh, I don't know enough about lakes and development as such, but m my general take is that the way we are developing lakes or renovating or rejuvenating lakes is a civil engineering problem right? and there's very little ecological thought that goes into these actions. And if you look at almost all the lakes that either PDA or BWA, whoever rejuvenates these lakes, there's a common design problem there. And one of it is they make it into a soup bowl. So it's, it's basically deepened, deepened out. It's become a deep soup bowl. And the mud is dug up and thrown on the embankment. They make nice walking track. Some lakes go on to put loudspeakers and play music. They, they play noise in the name of music. And there's lights and everything. And access to people accessing the lake is restricted. And these were open spaces, right? Lakes used to be open for us to go and now there are restrictions on when you can go enjoy nature. That's one part of the problem. And the other part is how biodiversity devoid they are in, in a sense that lakes across Bangalore used to be, I said they were man-made and there, were, there was only embankment on one side. And when there's embankment on one side, water flows in, the lake accumulates that extra water, slowly recharges it and it creates a shoreline. There's a shallow shoreline where this water is receding as it evaporates or gets absorbed. These shorelines are essential for a lot of biodiversity that's out there. Today what we have is soup all with stone pitchings. There's no shoreline. And, and we also have this habit of storing all the water in the lake. And probably that's, Sudhira and I were discussing this earlier, and that's probably the reason why we see so many floods in Bangalore. Because lakes, these lakes, if you imagine them, 300 or 400 years ago when they built them, they started them, was to store the excess water that came during the rains and slowly use them throughout the year. Bangalore was a dry habitat. And today we have all these lakes and then we have chosen to leave our domestic sewage into it. It looks beautiful. All these lakes look great. There are trees planted, trees again from the Western Ghats, native trees, everything. Are they the right things to do? And these are questions that we as citizens need to be asking. If we have our corporators, then we would have, or we don't, or or even even with your around where you live, there are lakes. I live near Jack Corrin, 
there's a very active group of uh, leak protection citizens there. And even in Jakur, there is this classic case of planting a forest along the, they call it the forest path, where there are trees from the western guards planted. It's good for birds, there are some birds out there, but it fundamentally changes what biodiversity the lake used to have. And, and I say Jakur because I've seen it when it had a shallow shoreline, you would get at least four or five different species of ducks that would migrate in thousands. And today you'll see one species of duck and you'll see five if you're lucky. And it, it also corresponds with how the lake itself is designed and and, and that, that essentially is my bone of contention with how lakes are developed. And this model is not just Bangalore, it's moving to across India now. Because if you think about it, it's a good solution even in terms of money, right? You're going to spend money digging the mud, you're going to spend money dumping the mud, and there's a lot of money that can exchange hands in that process. Whereas if you keep the lake as it is, and value it as a, even if you're empathetic or if you're neglecting it, there's no, there's no notion of making money there. I think that is a fundamental driver for a lot of why a lot of lakes get rejuvenated and the ecology gets replaced. And, and storing all this water again has hydrological consequences. The seepage, the salination that happens because water is stagnant for so long. Mosquitoes breed and, and then people complain and then it kind of goes back to a feedback loop, goes back to the, uh, oh, you're not managing the lake properly, oh, you should do something else. And use biofilms or all kinds of other notions come up and, and there's no end to that process. Yeah. So I guess that's my take. Sorry, I seem to have an opinion on this as well. In the sense, I've been working on some of this. So, uh, one, technically, we don't call them lakes, we call them tanks, because all, all were human bit. Uh, we don't have lakes, lakes, because that is a purist ecological notion of calling it as lakes. We don't have lakes in Bangalore. There are some natural water bodies, like I can I can tell you if you're walking across Bhavavad and Giri, you'll find a nice natural lake. Uh, all water bodies that we find in and around Bangalore are, including Hesogata, TGRD, are all human built uh, water structures. Now, we seem to have an imagination that just water body is the tank or that lake in that sense, but I guess we need to really look at it from a watershed perspective. And what we seem to be missing out are what, have, what has happened to all the streams that lead, draw water, collect water, and lead to the tank. And in a study that we did earlier, we discovered that more than 50% of the first order streams are lost. So from a watershed perspective, we look at it like the stream flows, right? Like they are the headwater streams that we have. And Bangalore has a, a very undulating topography and I'm sure you know that it has, now we have three watersheds. And across these watersheds, there were these first order, second order, third order. And what you see as Rishbhavati is almost the fourth order stream and things like that so they were there and we have lost a lot of first order streams and why we have lost also that because in the land revenue act the revenue maps don't show first order streams only the key streams like third and fourth order which connect between tanks are notified in the revenue map as per the Karnataka land revenue act right thank you uh, following on what Seshadri and uh, uh, <laughs> what what and uh, Sudhir have said, I have I, I think I'd like to add a point to what Sudhir mentioned, which is this: you really can't think of a tank as a tank. It's actually a part of a larger network of relationship. Here, the relationships are hydrological relationships. Similarly, I'd like to extend that idea a bit more. There are a variety of ecological relationships which Sheshatri again talked about. It's not you know you can you can make a, a a tank out of a natural water body and make this whole value about this water body is to maximize storage minimize silt and thereby lose a lot of ecological values in the process which you don't even know existed. Similarly, I think even in the human domain, what I am trying to say is that these places that we are talking about, open or otherwise, are places where the natural and the cultural overlap. And these are, are completely articulated, a natural space 
on which you create a cultural space is a conversation. It is a dialogue. It cannot be an imposition. It cannot be an obliteration of one in order for the creation of another. And how do you actually do a, a, a dialogue? And one of the things that I think has, again, this is like completely missing in the way people like us view lakes. I mean, they're, they're, uh, earlier they used to be stinking places, nobody could enter, there'd be thickets, oh, thank God, they've put a fence now, nobody goes in, and they're, they're clear, cleaned it up, there are paths, you can go everywhere. But, do we even realize that these places, even when they look very ungainly and, uh, you know, ugly to us, were foraging spaces for people. People graze their animals, even within the city. There were people who depended on it. People went and collected a variety of greens. People went and collected fish. Now, in reimagining the lake and beautifying these lakes, we have a lake development authority which develops lakes. And part of that, they are all fenced now, invariably. They are locked. You can't have cattle coming in. You can't have people coming and collecting. And these, in many situations, are people who actually are from that place. You ask me how do we you know, learn from the locals. Uh, locals. You don't learn from locals by cutting them off. Yeah. Cutting them off their resource base. Taking away their cultural relationship with the natural. So this, this idea of making an open space or any place matter is where when we can have a conversation between the natural and the cultural. And that is a collective action problem. If we only value the kinds of things that I and you care about, a nice place to walk, a safe place to take children, play area, whatever, you'll get that. But what have we lost in the process? This used to be a lived landscape, a used landscape, with which people had a variety of other kinds of relationships. They've all been erased in order to create these relationships. So I want to finally mention that these are not without, when we are talking about master plans and reimagining this, new legislations, we only think, we, we think that the direction in which we uh, go with development is one, one way. The United States is today has torn down thousands of dams, torn down, so that rivers can, and streams can flow free so that the salmon can migrate from the sea and go to the very streams in which they were born. Thousands of dams have been destroyed in the, uh, in the middle of Seoul. There was this entire area which it, I, I think Chongyong Chen I think is, is the, I don't know the name uh, very well, but Google this restoration of the waterway in the middle of Seoul, 10 kilometers in the middle of Seoul city, they tore down, it used to be a highway, it used to be an expressway. They tore down the expressway to recreate a stream. These are not choices that we, we are not without these choices. And I think we need to some, sometimes make these, you know, in very symbolic and emphatic ways. That this is the way we, we really create space for nature in the city. It's not by saying, oh, Nature is somewhere else, culture is here, city is all about culture, nature is far away. Nature in its place, culture in its. No. This is unruly and these relationships have always broken boundaries, there are no borders. And this is really, I think, integral to how we imagine or reimagine this. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Can I just take one more round of questions? Uh, uh, first round was more academic and conceptual, but now I think this set of questions will be how people planning process and uh, the knowledge experts can throw a uh, light on that. So as you also was mentioning about how we cut off locals, I had a direct experience thoroughly forest to an organizing workshop here and uh, we were to take, uh, you know, we went for a survey how local people will look at Naturally, for a simulation. So, we went on some questionnaire. Yeah. So, unfortunately, first one we ended up with the Shoba Forest apartment. That's one next to the forest only. So, that lady, first of all, very insecure that, that we are 
meddling with the forest and she is very protective. She said that, uh, you know, uh, I bought this apartment to protect the forest. <laughs> That's number one. Number two, she complained that a lot of local villagers on a particular festival, there is actually a temple inside actually, on the top of the hill. So they dirty it and go, you know. So this is, <laughs> so there is a new way people are, you know, they are enthusiastic but in a very wrong manner. So like a half knowledge and uh, so this is how uh, I did a kind of bad experience. Now coming down to these things about uh, local bodies are not really, uh, you know, doing their job or maybe they are, there is nobody to, uh, what you call, monitor them, that was the case and then government has put up some agencies, maybe an eyewash or maybe it's a manip manipulable system like MOEF clearance and uh, there is an NGT also is there. So I want you to throw light on since you have worked on legal claims. So can you just tell what are the pitfalls and how much they are effective or any suggestions or some tweaks that could happen? MOEF and NGT. So. Uh, yeah, I guess uh, what uh, the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change in OEFCC as it is now called uh, has a span across the country and so it can influence or make policies and decisions across. And uh, it largely comes and like, it can take under the purview of what is the Environment Protection Act of 1986 and the Environment Protection Act and things like that. Uh, very few acts, CPCBA thing or uh, things like that comes up. CPCB was formed after the Pollution uh, Control Act there. So uh, what it has a purview is on certain things that is that is impacted at a national scale. And now in the given scheme of things, uh, there have been certain set of thresholds set for different projects. Now, even in, the, uh, in the coming to the state level, right, I think even uh, for coming to the state level in the National Green Tribunal that has been established has been like the green bench, mostly like looking at cases pertaining to that and they accept some petitions and all of it. And as we speak, there is something going on to define uh, what's the carrying capacity in the eco-sensitive zone because uh, NGT had to intervene and ask the state government to do it. But otherwise, uh, the state government proactively doesn't do. So where we have come to today is, is that uh, uh, many of these things, right? I think uh, uh, there has been a very nice, uh, in a way, if I may say, uh, legal uh, uh, activism that has come in, particularly what we mentioned of Leo, right? Uh, uh, if you look at, again, going back to Hebar and Nagavara when they were being commercialized, uh, Leo filed a petition in late 2000s and early, and that there was a stay that came in 2012, and uh, basically the event that went on till 2018, uh, and that eventually led to form what is now as Karnataka Time Conservation and Development Authority, superseding the late development authority. Now all of this has happened because of sort of a legal jurisdiction sort of activism, if I may say, where the honourable court had to intervene and direct the respective governments to form appropriate things, right? I wouldn't say that that was a perfect thing, but I think that has happened because of a judicial outcome in the sense, in, the, in those aspects. Now, uh, the concern is, as in, uh, where were citizens? As in, it was, it was only a few individuals who thought about it and went to the Honorable Court and managed to convince and get some favorable, if not perfectly favorable one, which get something that directed the state to act. Now until then, neither the state represented by its, uh, its bureaucracy or the political leadership had taken any measures on that. Which points to a key concern that I would want all of you to reflect is where is the thought leadership, right? I think there is, there is a clear gap in thought leadership or at least the lack of thought leadership in both bureaucratic and political circles that is taking such proactive decisions that will impact a century. Again, I'll go back to when what uh, on Hesagata, right? Uh, it was Sir Sheshadri Iyer who initiated the water pipeline project. And you can still see the aqueducts and the water pipeline from like Hesagata to Sol Devanandi to all the way up to jewel filters and jewel filters to 
low level reservoir next to Kanija Bhavan on race course road. And if you go to that low level reservoir next to it, you will also see a small inscription saying Raghav Chalva 1899 and all of that. So there, there are things that were done by some of them. And if you know, we, we had, I'm not saying monarchy was good, but at least pre-independence, uh, when Krishna Jendra Vadeyar and Krishna Jendra Vadeyar were there, they made sure they appointed the right people as the ones. And incidentally, all of them took decisions that, in a way that, that we all have remembered till date. And you have localities named after them or everything that has been named after them. I can tell you a lot of stories on what Vishweshwarya did, what Sheshadriya did and things like that. So I guess it, it's also of the statesmanship type kind of leadership who thought more like uh, beyond their what I call as timeline of decision making. Right? If you, if you look at the current landscape, a bureaucrat, senior bureaucrat as in IAS, they don't have a tenure beyond three years and they get shuffled from labor to animal husbandry, back to women and child development and then something in education or transportation and things like that. This is true. You should, you should just follow how, how they get posted. And they, they are good managers, uh, right? So their, their tenure is only like less than three years. So what, what has come to happen is they don't want to take decisions which are intangible. And all of this that we are talking about, policy, legal reforms and all of those things, which are all long term. So the tenure has come to less than three years. And what about our political leadership? They are the ones who are supposed to make laws. And if you know, if you see that there is a new law that is being tabled in, in, in this coming legislative session called the Bangalore Metropolitan Land Transport Authority Act. This is not something that any political leader came up with. This was something that was got initiated because of the National Urban Transport Policy in 2000s. In 2008, there was an executive order, government order that set up Directorate of Urban Land Transport and the Bangalore Metropolitan Land Transport Authority through an executive order. There is no statutory backing to that. And since 2008-2010, there have been multiple drafts that were driven by IAS officers. And even as I speak, this new draft is also driven by a particular IAS officer and somehow she has managed to convince the powers that be that that can be tabled. I am not saying that is the best way to do. I think that such a the need for such a law or any such thing should have happened through a people's movement. And why I am coming back to that is that in, in, in our current era, that, that the epoch of time that we are in, our political leadership is not really looking anything like anywhere between less than five years, as in not more than five years, because their tenure is all, all stayed up. So nobody is doing like, and then if you look at the laws that I showed you, all were made like before 90s or like the last was in 80s. And there were some good amendments made to the KDCP Act during the 80s when Ramakrishna Negre was the chief minister. After that, we haven't seen any progressive amendment to the act also. So you don't need to necessarily make a new act, you can make an amendment. But even the amendments that we have made seem to be regressive. So which means the thought leadership in political leader circles and the bureaucratic times have been limited. And although we have good thoughtful leaders in the bureaucracy, their tenures are limited. So the timeline of decision making has really like come short compared to what you had with Diva Maharajas and the Divan's tenure. That's something that we may have to reflect. I'm not saying that's the good one, but we need to work around. Now, what is that work around that needs to be really looked at? Is why why is that? I've, I've also puzzled. Uh, I was also puzzled and really looked into why bureaucrats are not taking risks, although they know this is what needs to be done. It's not that somebody hasn't thought of. We have very smart IAS officers. They know how the systems work really, as in from the law, from everything. But why is that they are not biting the dust? Just because there is no political leadership or politician who is backing them up. I guess that's the key thing, right? As in if, 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 if there are some hard decisions any bureaucrat takes or the, the government wants to bring in, the political will needs to be there to support it. Now today for any decision the bureaucrats take, 
there is no backing to them. Unlike what would have happened perhaps during the Maharajas, and the, the Divan had a backing of the Maharaja for taking a decision. Or he would have convinced the Maharaja this is how it is. Including appointments. Like I know Raghav Charlu prevailed on Chamrajendra Vadeya to appoint Sir Sheshagraya who was a non kannadika And then they, if you go to the archives in Mysore, there are letters, oppositions done to appoint. Why should there be a non kannadika appointed in Mysore King as, in, as a next Divan? Despite that, since Raghav Charlu had prevailed over Chamrajendra Vadeya, he appointed Sir Sheshagraya. So there have been things like that where political backing was there. Now today you can't see such political backing for something that we think should be done or, or the way the political economy is going is, is in a different direction. I don't know if that answer to you yeah, but yeah, yes. Yeah. We need to really reflect upon what's happening yeah. around and, and, and the mechanics of how the systems are working. Yeah. I think it's about the long term vision and uh, you know, larger interest of the society for longer duration that is has to be paid. Not a major reaction of that time period. I think that's so important. Like, again, Right, as in, from from a planning perspective, right, as in, uh, whom are we planning for, yeah. and 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 the horizons that we look at. Yeah, right. I just want to ask: Does NGT have a, uh, any comment on the master plan made of any city? Uh, is there is some uh, I'm slot not, for it. There could be. I'm not aware of any such thing. In the sense, I think uh, uh, one has to build a nice case. Uh, against how the master planning is done okay. and then go to the engine okay. and then seek some sort of an injunction to yeah. say that we need a different yeah, yeah. perhaps that's a way of yeah yeah i think yeah it's good because i always thought when the entity comes up when there is a disaster happening on the ground you know uh, there is flooding has happened or some lake is frothing yeah, yeah. then there's a comment so that's too late you know i just thought if there's a mechanism to comment on it at least yeah, it forces the experts to at least start imbibing certain. Yeah. So for instance, or, right, as in I told you about this carrying capacity thing. Mm -hmm. So it's also, uh, I don't know if, if I can say it is funny, but uh, I'll allow you to you know, derive that or you know, uh, define whatever it is. I know this person uh, who mentored me like 30 years ago. Uh, he uh, petitioned for the NGT against the homestays that are coming up in and around Bawood and Gideon Mudai. Yeah, Lord and even Kurg also, a right? lot of them. So his case was against uh, all the homestays that are coming up and it is affecting the fragile grasslands ecosystems around that, as in if you've seen what has happened. And uh, incidentally, when it got, thankfully it got accepted in the NGT as a petition and when they whatever, uh, debated on it or uh, their thoughts prevailed on it, they decided they all they directed the state government is okay, they think we should identify eco-sensitive zones for this and since Western Ghats is also going to be eco-sensitive zone, uh, it asked the state government to do carry the under, undertake a carrying capacity study in an eco-sensitive zone. It didn't say where. So in the wisdom of the establishment of the current government, they said, since it didn't mention where, we'll do it in Bandipur because Bandipur eco-sensitive zone was the first eco-sensitive zone formally notified in 2012. So the petition started with Chikmagalur and has now gone to Bandipur. Right, so this can happen because that's what the NGT says and now this is being complied because NGT wants it. So there is there is also like you know uh, manipulated uh, Yeah, so uh, it's, it's also again both an, uh, a risk and an opportunity. Yeah, yeah. yeah this basically uh, in the garb of a concern, you just show some eyewash concerns and you still get away with it. That, that's an attempt actually. So now other one, this set of questions is about how a hodgepodge concerns are there from every, you know, either into war into the uh, citizen and uh, the war into the politician. But sometimes without the experts' uh, technical input, sometimes it can go wrong. Uh, one more thing that has been uh, floating around is the Miyawaki forests. I wanted to talk about it because you people are experts in forest and environment. So, okay, uh, maybe a lot of bureaucrats have traveled abroad and they have read, well read, maybe well read, half read, we can call it. Maybe. Many, many of them are botanists, many of them from some BSc agriculture like that. So, they know technically. and. Uh, Suddenly, this uh, Miyawaki has become a big uh, push, and simultaneously, I saw a nice article in the newspaper by some scientist 
Maybe I'm not going to do like one of the maybe you put the machine on. He said that don't think Mia Waki can be a replacement for real forest. Right? So very I like that statement. First manage good forest. Then you think about you know small patches where forest cannot be there as this one. Okay. So it's a you know there is enthusiasm but it cannot become a replacement. We mess up a big land and then make it into some Miyagi forest, you know. One only good thing that has happened is at least the idea of plantation which used to be some uh, Duranta and Dekalifas and some lawn areas as garden has been replaced with this assorted planting. But that cannot be a, a kind of, you cannot imagine that there will be ecology happening there. So can you just throw a light on that? <laughs> Madhu might be more appropriate on the restoration part of forests, but I'll, I'll, I'll okay, have my fine. say. Anybody then, can comment, you can again come back. No I, I, we've seen all this Miyawaki forest and yeah. it's, a, it's a method of rejuvenating land and growing yeah. forests. And, and I completely agree that forests are forests and anything else is a plantation. Yeah. You cannot recreate a forest in the sense, recreate all the intricate connections that happen between forests. You might go plant a bunch of trees, but a lot of, we still don't understand why forests are forests. That's, e ecology is so complex, the interactions are so complex and dynamic that it would be silly to imagine that we'd be able to recreate a forest. We can create an assorted diversity of plants that have some ecological role. Of course, Miyawaki forests are good if you want to, let's say, let's say you're planting a tree along a, along a stream or along a river where there's a lot of mud that's getting washed off. You want to hold that water, grasses are great, but if you want to protect some of the land, you might want to go plant trees there and this is, I, I digress a little bit and talk about, I, I was in Tamil Nadu last week and there is a river called the Tamraparani which the IAS officer there is also trying to restore and he has this three year deadline also, 2024 is going to get transferred so that's that's when they want to bring the water to, from bathable quality to drinking quality, that's the grand plan, 64 kilometers of the river but about 20-25 years ago there was this uh, Chief Justice or one of the Justices, Justice uh, Pandya, who was from a village called Tirupadai Mardu, where he was from and he had the, his house there and the river flows along his house and there was a lot of sand mining that used to happen and he noticed this and he decided to get one of his employees to go plant native trees there. So they went around, went around planting trees along the river bank and the sand mafia obviously they weren't happy but he was the, he was the Justice so they didn't uh, do anything and years later he was uh, he was actually one of the first few people who managed to establish a conservation reserve in that landmass mm -hmm. because the trees that they planted eventually ended up supporting a lot of painted stocks and uh, uh, flying foxes, the bats. Bats roost there and these birds come to nest there and because he, he was so environmentally active, the people in the village were supportive of the birds. It's It stinks and smells and it's noisy. But people don't really mind it and uh, I, we, we sat at Pandian's house and his house smells of bat. But people don't care, they collect the guano, they use it as fertilizer and everything. So there's a lot of local support also. So in that sense, did it, did it do some good? Did that plantation do some good? I would say yes. And, and there's, there's all these consequences that are happening also. Yeah, and and that's, that's my longer take on the answer on Niyawaki. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Madhu, I said because NCF was in, is still involved in restoring forests. Yeah, yeah, like you should comment on. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, I know of another state where lands came back after this lease expired from tea and coffee estates, and the forest department was took the land back, continued to pick coffee in those uh, okay. areas. After they continue to pick coffee yeah. even today, so the forest department on those lands today is employing forest guards to pick coffee. Wow. So, uh, <laughs> uh, now, the data part, I think uh, I want to kind of draw things together, which is that this is the, at, the, at the overlap of uh, the natural and the built environments, the natural and the cultural. This is, this is a very complex area and we've looked at the complexity ecologically, we've looked at the, complex, at the complexity legally, we've looked at the complexity uh, institutionally. So there is an enormous amount of complexity and all decisions that have to be made, choices that have to be made, have to be made through some collective process. 
So you cannot get away from the collective process. This is complex, but collective. So how do you go forward? I think one of the things that often gets suggested as a way of efficiently navigating this is to take recourse to expertise. And our expertise has been so reductionistic. That as an ecologist, I won't have the faintest idea of what city planning looks like. And as a city planner, you will have not have the faintest idea of what hydrology is like. And as a hydrologist, you won't know the first thing about energy. And all of you are making with abundant good intention, every expert is making with abundant good intention, very narrowly uh, kind of determined decisions, which have huge trade-offs when you really look at it in a holistic way. And that's really the place where I think so often, and, and that's, I mean, that is where I would look at the Miyawaki forest. That, oh, look at this, we just have concrete everywhere, where are the trees? Oh, trees will take another hundred years to grow, we, we, but we cut them down. The metro okay, we cut hundreds of them down, something else is coming, we'll continue to cut hundreds of them down, but we want trees now. What can we do? So, here, there is this amazing technique, you can grow trees rapidly and you can and wow, that's that's fantastic. So, what happens is that there is expertise of a certain kind and what I would call a bunch of tech solutions. We are obsessed with tech solutions. We believe that we can actually cause an enormous disruption in a socio-ecological landscape and fix it with, with one tech band-aid. Someone, it's as if nature never existed. Nature doesn't know how to grow forests. It took one human being, Miyawaki, to go figure out what to do. And that is our solution. And it will work everywhere, all the time. That is what is fundamentally very problematic about this notion of expertise and tech fixes. I think what we need, they, they might be great. You get your, you, you show that it's possible. But the hundred failures at, at the cost of, the cost which might be in hundreds of failures which are needed for one success to be demonstrated don't and, and huge amounts of money is expended often for absolutely the wrong reasons if we go this way the alternative is very messy you have to listen to dozens of different kinds of people who don't share a common worldview, a common vocabulary, a common language, a common set of objectives, but they share space. And that space is really where you need to make, make sense. So I would argue that that is far more, you can have effective solutions, but do you also need enduring solutions. You want to build that embankment that lasts 150 years. Nobody is going to win that election 150 years later for something great that you did today. So, the horizon over which we are optimizing the value of our decisions is very narrow. But I think this is fundamentally political. And when I say political here, I don't mean party politics. I mean that when we have different points of view about the same thing and we have to come to a common decision, the process is a political one, where we have to negotiate with each other, where we may have to reconcile to something we disagree with, or agree with, uh, or have some, persuade someone to agree with what we are doing. You may not do it for the best technical reasons, you, because we are not just technical beings. We need equity, we need fairness, we need justice, we need inclusion. These are also values by which we try to live in a civilized democracy. It's not merely that, you know, we are, the world is made up of ecologists and architects and everyone else doesn't count. So, how do we relate to those realities of that world? And I think I would, I would very strongly de-emphasize the role and the importance of experts. I think the more we can make these common spaces, you know, make these open spaces that matter, open in the sense, not physical, but also intellectually, in terms of ideas we need to make these open spaces, where someone who's never been to school can come and sit and share their experience which they have accumulated entirely through what they have observed and gained through other means. 
and that is a first first class input into your planning process as he's been talking. That's the kind of change we need. I, I think we have had enough of experts and we've seen where they've brought us. Nothing to do with almost some meet up before some meet up. So now we will uh, take some questions from people. Uh, so please show your questions. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Uh, I'm a fifth semester student, and for our uh, architecture and design studio, uh, we had this project uh, which was based in Kormangla. Uh, there's this BBMB park and there's a lake uh, just beside it and our project is basically support we were supposed to uh, create a public space uh, which in the program would be an exhibition a library uh, an archive will that would that is the program of the project we are supposed to build hypothetically and uh, we i am kind of stuck where i that the lake has its own ecosystem and there are uh, two sides to the uh, lake, which is one of one of the sides is Mestipalia, where uh, the lo the locals are uh, from a lower income community. Uh, there are cattle herders in that uh, space, and the other side, just uh, on the other side, is the n normal Kormangla area where uh, people have normal jobs. And so uh, it, it's like as a designer, what do you think I should keep in mind? Uh, if I'm designing so that I don't disturb the ecosystem but also keep in mind locals and uh, design the space. You talked about the shore condition of the lake, uh, I mean the tank and stuff like that. So I don't know. I mean, yeah. uh, yeah, isn't very quickly. Uh, I guess, I, I think I mentioned earlier that I think we, we need to do a lot of unlearning and uh, what is normal. Uh, I would think the folks who you mentioned as normal are whom I would bucket them under new citizens because they are the new residents there. So we may have to step back and look at who were the actual, who are the actual stakeholders or who have been uh, interacting with, with the system there. and. Again, uh, like I said earlier, I think from a planning or design perspective also, I think it should not be prescriptive and you should co-evolve. Uh, in the sense, you need to address to their aspirations and then also bring them to think, is, is, think on what is possible. And that is what we can provide. Like if there are aspirations that are there from a planning uh, perspective, you can say what is all possible. And then it's very political in the sense you have negotiations to arrive at what, what, what what could be possible. So a quick thing is, I think, uh, we'll have to still understand who, is, who are the actual stakeholders there and then gather their aspirations and then go ahead with that. Fantastic conversation that we are having. Uh, very deep and very rich. Uh, totally concur with a lot of viewpoints. Um, I just want to understand one thing. Um, you are talking about wards and uh, the allocation of open spaces in the wards. I'll tell you where I'm coming from. Um, the administrative plan of Bangalore has eight zones. You have uh, the south, you have the east, west. Um, I mean, um, I think Yelanka, Aradnagar and... Yeah. Uh, so, if we see the number of open spaces dedicated to each zone. I don't know if I have to talk about the zonal level or I have to talk about the ward level. I just want to understand the process over here. Um, we see that south zone has almost 345 parts, approximately. And uh, Mahadevpura, which is double the area, more than double the area of the south zone, has only 26. I just want to understand the process of allocation of open spaces that's happening in the city. Can you please throw some light on yeah. it? Yeah, I guess uh, it's also the timeline of the developments of all of this. Uh, I wish I had shared another map where I look at uh, uh, what has been the jurisdiction of Bangalore from 1537 to 2007. So uh, it was in 2007 that the city corporation's jurisdiction was expanded 
from 225 square kilometers to 741 square kilometers, which uh, basically annexed 110 villages and several uh, all city corporations and one year got on municipal council. Uh, in that process, Mahadevpura also got included. Uh, coming to the parks issue, like why you have uh, more parks in south zone of now BBMP is because south zone comprises of Basmanguri, which was formed in late, I think, 1898. As in the Chamraj Basmanguri were formed Maleshwaram. Chamraj was much earlier, but uh, Maleshwaram and Basmanguri happened in 1898. And then uh, you also had other uh, new uh, layouts that were done post independence. That was uh, Rajaji Nagar and Jayanagar. And another trivia around that is uh, Jayanagar was inaugurated by Rajaji. Rajaji Nagar was inaugurated by Jayacham Rajendra Valiya. Right? Both of them happened to be there. And this is how Rajaji Nagar and Jayanagar happened. And they were all formed uh, before what we now have uh, as Bangalore Development Authority because back then you had something called the City Improvement Trust Board. Now, these were all formed under the CITP thing. And there, there were a lot of provisions for having parks and all of that. And that's when you had Lakshman Rao Park, or, or then it was just the Boulevard, but then later on they named it as Lakshman Rao Boulevard. So there were those parks that were happened, that got happened uh, in, in those localities that were then developed by CITB slash BDA and all of them. Now if you look at the outer zones, right, they were not planned by either CDA, CITB or BDA. They, somewhere post 90s and early 2000s, there was a transition that the BDA moved or sort of allowed private real estate to you know, take over and develop revenue layouts, right? And none of these revenue levels, although notionally you have in, in like both in the BD Act and the KTCP Act saying you should have so much percentage of like, there is a like thumb rule if you go to a developer, right? Uh, you have an acre of land and they say how much of it will be like convertible into sites, they will say 50 to 54 percent, right? Because the rest goes for you no know, roads or you have open play, play uh, no, parks and play areas and other things or CVS. So 50 to 54 percent is the rate. If you ask the developer, that, that is what the number they will come to. Now, although notionally you have that, the proportion of it is very low. Like when you when you look at it at, at the larger scale, and I think in Jainagar, Basmanguri areas, the and JP Nagar also, you had a greater proportion than what is now in these revenue levels. And often this is not complied. So there is also an issue of compliance of how. Uh, uh, BDA developers. So, uh, anecdotally, I can tell you, like when 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 these layouts, other layouts were developed by BDA, BDA engineers would be there, verify everything is done, and then go over it. Now, I'm told, or rather, I gather that none of the revenue layouts that go for a permission, not necessarily you have the current BDA engineers inspecting in person. So, notice when I think of this, I guess you should, you should, uh, uh, yeah, I guess it's also about being legally aware of what all you can do. Uh, so whenever, and uh, incidentally what has happened is also in the provisions of the Karnataka Town and Country Planning Act, even though if an area is designated as something else, so there is a provision for change in land use. Uh, I would encourage all of you to take a look at your newspapers every day, at least once in two or three days, you have a new notification asking for change of land use. Because somebody has bought something that was in either some zone that is not as per the, the RMP 2015, so they have applied for an applicant, like through, there is a formal process where you apply for a change in land use. And, and the process is once you apply after looking at basic paperwork, BDI will notify in a public newspaper asking if there are any objections to it. None of us have objected to it. And I have a friend, you should talk to Jairaj Sundaration, who analyzed all such change of land uses by BDA. That was his PhD work. Uh, so he looked at it and, and there was a host of things. And incidentally, BDA is putting up all the change of land. If you go, should, you should go to the BDA website and there is a section called town planning. Under that you will find something called as change of land use. 
And then you will get a list of all of those things that have permitted for change of land use. Now, as citizens, you have all the right to file objections. And I don't think any of us are doing. Uh, okay, uh, another uh, adult question. Like, we are talking about citizen participation. Right. Um, NGOs like Janagraha have come up with a platform, I Change My City. So, what do you think of these platforms? What do you think of citizen participation platforms? And of course, we have the divide, you know, the literate versus the non-literate. So, it's a huge chunk of population, either ways, either sense. So, how, how should we manage? Uh, and uh, first of all, first question is, do these platforms like uh, what Janagraha is proposing, does it have the power to, you know, uh, uh, get our viewpoints in our consolidated place? Does these platforms, do these platforms help actually? Uh, okay. Uh, one, I think to some extent it does help. There have been different, uh, or there are different organizations working at different levels. And as we speak, there is a new thing called uh, City Res uh, Resources Forum, CRF. I would encourage you, those of you who are concerned to really join the forum. Uh, it's putting together all different NGOs working on this, including Janagra, uh, uh, Civic, Katya Inu, who is working on war planning for the last 30 years and all of that. So, and there are different new groups who are also working at a world level, world level planning and all of it. So there are different platforms and I think all these platforms are, are, are a good entry point for any of us uh, to understand some of the aspects of the city. But having said that, I think uh, there is there's also, I have a different perspective on this. I think this is, this is largely for the trained, learned, educated, quote unquote. I don't. I wouldn't call it educated because I think uh, all of us are qualified because you have a degree and you're qualified for the degree. So we are quote unquote qualified uh, literate folks uh, for whom bulk of this uh, education is required. Uh, in the sense, if you look at uh, low income group or any of those, they are already trying to access uh, different services by the government in different ways. And incidentally, they are the ones who are voting. Uh, their voting turnout is very high. Again, to give you again some numbers on this, the uh, percentage of voting in Bangalore has been like less than 50% in the assembly elections. And the percentage of voting in Gupi assembly constituency is like 91-92%. So there is, there is a difference as well. In the sense, the part, kind of participation that you find uh, with respect to like just voting, which I would want to look at it as a key measure of your civic participation, uh, there is a market difference. There is also further market difference in terms of your ward electorate, because in Gopi, although for a 25,000 population, we have 19 wards. It's effectively one representative for every 1,000, 1,200 persons. In Bangalore, every ward is like 50 to 1 lakh, 50,000 to 1 lakh. So you have only one representative for that. So the ratio is, is skewed, right? I, th I think we also have to relook at how are we organizing our city systems. So uh, again, a long answer, but I think uh, we need to understand more. As in, as citizens, we need, we need, we need like I said, empathize and uh, understand a lot more. Uh, there was one behind and then I left. No, on the blue shirt. Yes, sir. So, very good afternoon. Uh, so, I just have one question. Like, you showed about wasteland. Like, the majority of the discussion was about wasteland today. So, what is the percentage of uh, cultivable land as wasteland, sir? And uh, in uh, relation to that, uh, is species extin uh, extinction a cause of it? Because wasteland, if, if it is a wasteland, there is no food for it and thereby extinction. No, like I to go back to my definition, I, the, the definition of wasteland mm. is enti was entirely from the point of view of the colonial government where land that did not give you revenue, you could tax agriculture, you could, ta you could get revenue from forests. Land that didn't give you money was what was wasteland. First, we should get that very clear. It was not land that was useless. No land 
is useless. Ecologically, most definitely so. So, this is the definition of wasteland. It's not that wastelands are places where animals don't have food. Oh, cultivable. So, why is, is a desert cultivable? Oh, it's, so why an arid, is it, no. it's an arid region. So. No, but if you, if you were to uh, enrich the soil, bring water, is it cultivable? It can be. Indira Gandhi Canal has come into the deserts of India. Just look at the map of how it has transformed cultivation in the desert area. So, is desert cultivable? So, the idea of culti cultivable at what cost? At what cost? So, if you are going to deplete all the groundwater, if you are going to start importing soil organic matter, it's cultivable. Are you willing to do that? Is that the rate at which, is that the cost at which you will make something cultivable? These are the choices we have to make. It's not, so similarly, to extend it further, you are talking of cultivation. People are saying this is, uh, it's worthless in other ways, so we'll produce energy. It's, so at what cost are you going to produce energy? Or we'll capture carbon. So, you must understand that all the tree planting that's happening in these arid areas is happening, we are adding carbon at the cost of depleting water. Eventually, the tree is too dull because there isn't, you can't permanently provide water. There is a certain environmental regime, there is a certain soil uh, condition and technology, because you can drill and uh, tap water now, you can't ensure uh, a water supply into perpetuity. That is the reason it is added. So there is so, an imbalance basically. So we, we have the technology to mess up things a lot. So, because we look at it over a short time period, I start a project, it's funded for the next five years. I can show that a large area has been planted and now there are so many trees that are, have survived. In another ten years, they will die. So, we eventually, like he showed, if you really look at that, the foreshore area of Esargata, what have we achieved? How much was spent? So at what cost are we going to carry out these interventions? Our intent might be honest, but if, you, if there is a lot of money coming into a small area or a short period of time, it will invariably attract the wrong people for the wrong reasons. That is the world we live in. So I think a lot of planning is, is essentially trying to stimulate and prime this process. I'm sorry, this is a cynical view, but I think it's not really cynical, it's realist. It's more now than cynical. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, I have a quick question, uh, this kind of following up. Uh, I think, uh, anyway, first of all, thanks for that amazing set of talks, and it's so important to talk about all this in an architecture school for sure, because as you know, our students also work with projects, and Bagish is a landscape architect himself, so this ecology kind of floating around in the background but not as much as it should and it's talked about as something that's separate from people as you're also. So uh, I think uh, all talks across the, board, uh, across the board, they were talking about citizen participation in different ways and talk of people's participation, let me not say citizen because neo-citizens is something we all talk, in planning it's fashionable now to talk about that. But also, uh, in terms of citizen participation, there seems to be no dearth of it. If you talk about law, for instance, Udira, there is the amendment CA 75, mm -hmm. amendment Act 74, sorry, amendment Act, and then you've got a uh, lot of citizen forums that mushroom since the 90s. <coughs> in Bangalore, if you look at Bangalore, you have Janagraha and ESG. ESG has been around a little longer, Civic, many of them. Uh, and then, uh, as Ishadi is also talking about how people are trying to do things in Hesarveta with maybe it might be outside of the law. And uh, Dr. Madhusudan was also talking about how, uh, make, um, you didn't talk about law, and, but people are very important and having conversations with not educated people in the formal sense of education. So uh, then, but in all of these, and we, who educates the educated then? Because we talked about the bureaucrats, we talked about the experts, <coughs> and and even if you talk about people, well-intentioned, well-meaning people protecting lakes and all the stuff that's happening in our open spaces, I guess, in the city, uh, there are they're very well-intentioned in many cases, right? But then, is there a, an answer to that? Then how do you kind of debunk this idea of experts and citizens? 
Yeah, so I guess uh, at large, right, I think uh, what really uh, also has happened is, is also what we call ask a question. as information asymmetry. Because all of us operate under incomplete information. Mm -hmm. And the choices we make are of based on perceived out, you know, outcomes for a certain decisions we take. And that is based on like the available information we have. And often all of us have incomplete information. I guess so which means that uh, breaking that information asymmetry is key, which means more people need to be aware of what it is. And that's where I guess outreach and communication plays a key role in in an engaging, not really in arriving at something. So it's about having an engagement and discourse than actually arriving at anything. That's why I, I like Bacchus quote, that the more we know, the less we would want to interview. Right? I think, uh, again, uh, concurring with what Madhu and Sheshadri said, when it comes to ecosystems or even like all the wastelands or any open spaces and all of it, uh, the best thing that we do, what actually is or what they thought ecology was with what it actually is. And it's definitely not a fast process. It's going to take, take its time. Whether is it going to be fast enough for us to make a meaningful difference or not is a larger question, but there are such efforts and there ought to be, definitely there ought to be more. I think various institutions, various people in their own different capacities are doing it. I think it's just like what Sudhira said, as citizens we ought to be keeping our ears to the ground and looking out for opportunities also. The way, I, I understand this, whether it's urban planning or nature <coughs> conservation. They're both collective action problems. And you can't go wrong in a collective action problem by increasing participation. And that is actually very hard to do with the kind of uh, the information and other kinds of asymmetries that our society has. So I would say the way to do this, and there isn't one way of doing it, but the way to do this is I think through a deepening of democracy. I think if you can get into a room, a bunch of people who do not represent the same kind of view, the same kind of demographic, the same kind of, uh, uh, I don't know, the, the way they make a living, the way they have been trained and know about the world, if you can get people more and more unlike each other into one, any one gathering, whether it's decision making or understanding, that is the what I'm calling deepening of democracy. And I think there is no substitute to that. And we can never have enough of this in a constitutional democracy since it's, as Sudhira has very kindly reminded us, Constitution Day. So I think it's we, we have to really go back to deepening democracy. But it's not going to be easy. It's going to be extremely messy. But I think it's worth it. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, it's not a question, though. It's, I just wanted to know your... Uh, uh, opinions and first of all thank you very much for coming to an architecture college and sharing your uh, knowledge and uh, in in one of the studios uh, that I'm part of we are trying to um, um, build values of how do we bring biodiversity while designing the building that's a question it could be I mean you know for an echo I don't know I want to know from you is it a very very romantic and utopian uh, idea so if you had uh, a designer, an architect, to build your house. How would you? I mean, what? How would you want that to uh, go? That's my question. Or to know your opinion as to how would you want? How would you bring in the building in a city? Of course, one is to say uh, we can always move to a rural area, but I think for a country which is going to be the number one population, sitting on a, a small land density is a concern. So we will have cities. But how do we still bring <coughs> biodiversity, both flora and fauna, as a built environment? Do you think it's possible? I mean, do ecologists just brush it aside? No, it's not. Let's keep the two aside. Or you think a middle ground can can happen? I want all the three of us, three of them, to role play architect. <laughs> and it's not one person. So each one should answer this. <laughs> that will be conclude with that. What our level? You can take. Weird take you can do, no problem. <laughs> I don't know if I have a very weird take, but I would, uh, I think 
we are always we are in the business of making trade-offs. How we make these trade-offs is really any trade-off you make will be imperfect, will be incomplete. We have to go in with complete awareness of that. That we, we are building a play, we are building something. We are not trying to bring back something else. So if in the act of trying to replace what is natural with something that's cultural, we are not going to help nature flourish. There is no way it's going to happen. So, but at the same time, we can certainly keep that as a part of uh, a sentiment, a value that is important. So I don't think we should get confused about what is our objective and what is the and, and what, what sorry what is the outcome we want and what is the process we're going to take. The outcome might be that we want a building, but the process we want to be environmentally more sensitive in and free and, and willing to be interrogated in every which way. So there, I don't think there is a way of, of furthering biodiversity in the act of creating some human artifacts. I don't think that's possible. But I don't think, don't even think that should be the objective of something. We are in, we are trying to create a cultural artifacts. We are not biodiversity doesn't need us, but cultural artifacts need us. So if we are in the business of creating cultural artifacts, let's do that. Let's be more mindful of the biodiversity cost it will take. There, how do you reconcile this? I would look at the idea of well-being from ethics, which has two components. Well-being has non-maleficence do no harm is the first thing and beneficence which is to do good i think the first thing would be to do no harm that is very i mean these are just two words but they're extremely hard so how can you actually place your artifact a cultural artifact upon nature and make it sit lightly that is not a small challenge but i think these are two things of, of <coughs> of non-maleficence and beneficence that I think could be used to guide them. I will just pull out a few examples of where the people have tried doing this, reconciling biodiversity with urban scapes. And this, I go back to Singapore, where I studied, and their catch line is from a city, a city with a garden to a garden in a city, or the other way around. City in a garden is their catch phrase. They've gone ahead and done amazing things, and again at phenomenal monetary cost. And and again, Singapore has its own history. It used to be a kampong, a village, with all kinds of biodiversity, and they decided to go develop and build a city. And now they've come around, and they want to bring back biodiversity, and they've succeeded in some ways. And there is, I think, a lesson to learn for other places also because it's development. Like what Madhu said, there's no there's no way you can put it. We are building buildings, we are having multi-story towers. In one of the hostel blocks where we lived on the university campus, we had trees that were planted on the eighth floor and we would get birds like the oriole, which are canopy dwelling species that would come visit these trees. Is it because the tree has a resource or is it because there is no other habitat for them is another different question. But if you just make a list of all the biodiversity that is found in cities, sure, I would score Singapore as one of the good ones. And, and they also did a comeback with restoring the rivers. So there's one central river that flows through and used to be polluted, they re rejuvenated it, renovated it and all that. And now, now we have the smooth-coated otters that have come from Malaysia. Malaysia is this arm-like thing just north of Singapore and they have they've recolonized the city. There are colonies of otters in the city and people are aware of it. They go eat people's koi fish, that's another story. And, and there are flashpoints also by having biodiversity in it. There's another angle to this whole thing where in our effort to try and bring biodiversity back into the city, there's an ecological concept that we call as the ecological sink, where you draw in species into a city with some bit of suitable habitat, but these habitats are no longer viable, to, they're not enough to sustain a viable population of individuals. So we might also <laughs> run the risk of drawing species in from outside and then eventually letting them die. And that's something we ought to be aware of when planning nature scapes or planning landscapes within cities and, and I think that's a much longer discourse trying to understand. It begins with understanding what used to be there or what is there and what might be the potential consequences of trying to do any of these things. Is there potential to do such things in Bangalore? Of course, Sudhira mentioned about 
connecting corridors, right? And again, Singapore had this great example they call the Park Connector Network. You could go across the island, walk or cycle or run from one park to another, and the same pathways were used by animals. Butterflies would use the same landscape. There are birds that move through the same landscape. Are these essentially good things? I would say yes. Can every country do it or can every city do it? Maybe. We have to again think of local solutions, see how we can minimize our impacts. And again, this is not just with the structure of the building, but also in the process. A lot of the dams that we build or a lot of the construction that we do, there's a lot of mud that gets washed into a stream nearby. And that's going to kill off a lot of organisms that are in the stream. And often in terms of mitigating impacts and stuff like that, we don't think of these consequences. It, it's very within that parcel of land. But what goes out is also important. And these are conversations we ought to be having. So, you know. Yeah, I guess uh, I agree with what both of said and said. I think, see, at, at some point, right, as in as humans, and uh, you can't uh, deny the fact that we will need houses to s live. So you need to build houses. I'm not saying you shouldn't build houses or, or <coughs> anything that's that's central there. Uh, but having said that, I think what we do, what really happens is that I think we need to understand, like what Madhu said, you can't really mix cultural aspects and ecological aspects together. But once you have built something, or even before you have built, if you have an appreciation of what was there, and then you still go ahead and build, and if if some of them are still around and are coming around, you have to be sensitive them, sensitive to them, and allow them to be around. Like I would draw you exact, you know, uh, draw you to some of the examples. Let's say in the Western Ghats, or like we also have a field station in Bista where we, with a lot of thought, uh, our benefactor got a container home because we didn't want to build anything concrete. So we just like we, it's just a choice because we had to like we, we have to spend time there and like we have to spend nights rather. So you still need some place to stay. So you have a container home that they, that's a trade off that we are consciously making. Uh, and and after we don't we don't live there every day, but when you go back every other month, you see like you have what not you have spiders. Last time we saw a gecko. So a draco. Draco. Yeah. A flying lizard. Yeah. So you have all of them there. So. Uh, things like that. So, but the thing is, you have to be sensitive <coughs> enough to allow them to coexist. In the sense, uh, I guess that sensitivity is what we need to learn or start appreciating. Or, yeah, that, that. He has a question, I'm very curious. Ganesh, that is, he is the future, Mr. Ganesh. He's the future of the earth. He has a formidable knowledge of birds. <laughs> yeah, 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 I know the birds. Yeah, yeah. The very concept of architecture actually has an impact on nature. Yep. Correct. I, I very much agree. Sorry, I'm just adding one thing there as is when building houses, right? I always also had a gloss on uh, the architects also because if you look at uh, the kind of construction or the structures that we have built, no longer we support uh, small crevices where yeah, birds could nest. And, and and the fallout has been sparrows no longer find places to nest. Yeah. Right? But if you go to like semi urban rural, they can still find crevices to nest. And uh, I, I, I don't know if it's cultural or uh, lack of ecological appreciation. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry, yeah. Yeah, concluded. If you look at urban wildlife, they are actually not supposed to be urban. In fact, uh, some, there once was something called Asiatic cheetah. They used to live here, thrive, but were poached to extinction. Now government are trying to put the African cheetah in India. And then now, Owls was actually supposed to be in forests eating mice. Instead, owls are in cities hunting rats just running around. And then bats, they eat moths. They are actually supposed to be in caves. But instead, also another example of what we are doing is the pink-headed duck presumed extinct global warming climate change and also um,
pollution are one of the main things. Tree loss is also one of the reasons for global warming. Thanks, Ganesh. The future generation. Yeah, please, sir. Please, Yeah, I guess I think what we really need to really look at it is uh, uh, all of these birds and animals that you mentioned, of, right? Like the owls have always been here. Uh, everything else was, has always been here. It's just that we have also over, but overpopulated and expanded and moved them away. Uh, I don't think they were like they've come here after. Like the only thing that has come here afterwards is uh, are the rock pigeons. Uh, we want had a scavenger vulture on IAC campus main building that no longer seems to be around. We have a whole bunch of owls and all of those uh, wildlife and uh, things like that have always been here. We are the ones who have encroached. I guess, I, I guess that realization we should have. And just add the... Please. Because you said IAC, I, I just want to also add that IAC has an inscription stone. Again, going back to at least a thousand years old. It's called a Kulibete Viragalu, which mentions the villager from Daivasandra, which is currently Devasandra, had hunted a tiger on the IAC campus and there's a Viragalu commemorating this victory. So there were in fact other animals like the tigers, which we think that they should be in the forest, not in the city. They've been here. For them, cities don't, I think Madhu mentioned it in the beginning of the talk, that there are no boundaries. And animals perceive landscape very differently from what we perceive them as. So, wildlife is part of the city. Last note, sir. I think we started with a very warming kind of situation, but now we ended with a lot of positives. Uh, you know, I think some of the key words that I can pick up is democratizing the process. I think very valuable. More people participate, much balanced view. Uh, he talked about the legal awareness, legal strengthening. Sir talked about the knowledge and technical part, which infuses strength to the proposals. I think these are the key words and of course the new generation is well aware. So I think there are a lot of positives to take from here. Thank you all of you for a wonderful discussion. Thanks. Thank you all. Thanks. Thank you. I think it's the first few words. Yeah. Thank you. 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 It's a formal vote of thanks yeah. as we are approaching the end of this session. Uh, yes, actually to summarize my whole experience, not just as an organizer, but as an audience also. We started our first discussion, first panel yesterday, which was talking more about open spaces in terms of the, or rather in relation with the built masses. And we were speaking more about the morphology of the city. And we were speaking about the overall quantum of the spaces that we have left, or whatever we have got from after leaving our built masses. Then the second session was actually questioning about the quality of the open spaces which were coming out as a result of our current frame, uh, legislative framework and is it more restrictive or is it more uh, you know binding in a sense that we as a designer even if we want to go beyond certain levels we are not able to go probably today's session was again a step ahead of that and it was actually questioning if and if the humans should be the center of this entire process and as a developer or as a consumer, should we just look at us or should we start really looking into the entire ecosystem of it? So really, thanks a lot for this enriching experience for all of us. It is definitely a good uh, platform for sharing these thoughts between a professional to professional and yes, there is a less number of students but whoever is here would take this thought ahead. I would like to thank formally today's uh, panelists Dr. Sudhira, Dr. Mudir Sudhan, and uh, Dr. Seshadri. I would also like to formally thank our uh, previous panelists here, Dr. Sweta Vyahut, Dr. Shanmuga Priya, and architect Premjit Das Gupta, who were the yesterday's uh, planner panelists. Then uh, the first panelist, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, architect Mohan Rao, architect Rajesh Ranganathan, and architect Rohanna Shashidhar. I would definitely like to thank here to our respected uh, moderators, today uh, architect Varnish Nagdu, yesterday's uh, second panel uh, architect Dinesh Rao and first panel uh, architect Mira Vasudev. I would like to thank our trust RSST, our principal Dr. O.P. Bhavani, Dean Pro uh, Professor Suresh Murthy, the management who were able to help us to organize this event, especially the technical support Mr. Sanjeev, 
and definitely our student uh, volunteers Sagar, Anirudh, Ishwar, Spurti, Akansha, Arpita, Lisha and Sakit. Thank you. Thanks a lot.